Hi, Carlos. Hi, Scott. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. I was just going to uh, test with Carlos to see that his uh, presentation was shareable. Uh, yeah, yes, just yes. Yes. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, just give me a minute. I still need to open sure. it here. Just want to give a heads up to everybody. We started the live stream, but I'm not recording yet. Okay. Good morning. So let's see. I think you should see the slides now. Ooh. Yes, looks good. It looks full screen. Um, you can see my face. <laughs> yes. Okay. Very good. So okay. we'll... I really don't like that uh, that image every time they use it. it looks like there are uh, worms instead of gluons. Instead. <laughs> well, it's a new one that uh, was created recently. Yeah, for yeah, 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 I know. I know. Um, the other ones are, are less uh, three-dimensional. <laughs> These are three-dimensional gluons, but yeah, I agree. It's a little <laughs> weird. <laughs> I'll step away for, for a minute, I'll be back. Sure. Stay kind of early, actually. No, but uh, also yesterday, uh, almost everybody arrived at the last minute. Just in time, yeah. I sent a reminder on Slack. Yeah. Alex, you know what I'll do? You want me to start the properly start the webinar that way anybody that's on the outside can kind of start funneling their way in now sure yeah okay it's, um, it's late enough so i'll start the record and i will start the webinar okay thank you very much i'll be here if you need me thanks alex okay Okay, the number of students is uh, growing. We start in a couple of minutes, probably.
Filippo, in the chat, were you asking for the YouTube of JLab? I mean, only JLab no, or the Rails? No, 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 JLab. Oh, yes. Okay, I don't know. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> Oh. I'm glad that also our students from the like farther away states with the weirdest time zone for us are joining. I can see Kazuki, for example, that is uh, 11 p.m. for him. <laughs> so, yes. But the okay. closest, the latest. Yeah. Okay. If you're uh, okay with it, Carlos, we can uh, probably start. Uh, yes, then. yes, so that's, uh, that's mm -hmm. fine with me. Okay, so welcome everyone to the second lecture of uh, DVCS and uh, spatial imaging. Yesterday we received a really positive uh, feedback from uh, you during the ARC school about the first lecture of uh, Carlos. So um, just one announcement uh, before uh, people visit. Uh, please students remember that today is the last day to submit the abstract for the poster or the seminar session. So you have time still uh, until midnight to submit it. Many of you already did. So if you didn't, please go ahead. And uh, meanwhile, Carlos, please uh, start. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so good morning or good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, uh, so welcome to the second uh, lecture on the VCS and spatial imaging. Um, so after the, the first lecture yesterday, which was mainly in, in introduction, so, so today we'll be more um, concentrated, uh, concentrated on, on the VCS itself. Um, so we will uh, first review um, some experimental results on uh, using protons at, at targets uh, as targets uh, in the first part of the of the lecture, and then at the end we will also see some results using uh, quasi-free neutrons um, as targets, or actually deuterium targets, as, as you will see, which has the advantage of allowing uh, flavor decomposition of uh, of GPDs or, or quantum form factors to to be more specific. If we combine and results from proton and, and neutrons, we, we, we can do that. So let's start with a, a quick reminder for, of what we saw yesterday. So ba basically, we reviewed three different ways to, to, to study the, in the internal structure of, of nucleons. First, uh, elastic scattering, where we measure form factors, and, and that uh, we can relate to Fourier transforms um, through Fourier transform to, to the spatial distribution of, uh, of the constituents. Uh, the charge, uh, actually it's a Fourier transform of, of the charge distribution and, and magnetization distribution inside the, inside the nucleus. Then we, we saw deep inelastic scattering where we measured uh, parton distributions, which uh, give us a momentum distribution basically of partons inside the nucleon. <clears throat> And as we saw, the, these are two, two views of the internal structure which are complementary, but they also both have uh, similar drawbacks, right? The parton distribution, they do not contain any information about the position of the constituents, and form factors uh, do not contain any information about the dynamics of the constituents. So we saw that by studying more general functions, uh, we, we can access uh, both momentum and position information of the internal constituents. And these are uh, the so-called uh, generalized parton distributions. And one way to access them experimentally is by, by measuring uh, hard exclusive processes. 
and in particular the, the one which uh, is the easiest to do this is uh, deeply virtual content scattering uh, which uh, we will be describing in, in more detail uh, today so here's uh, once again the, the the leading twist diagram for the vcs where at sufficiently high q squared the interaction happens of a single quark of the nucleon which absorbs the virtual photon and then changes its momentum fraction from C plus, uh, x plus psi to uh, x minus psi with an overall momentum transfer to the proton equal to the variable t. So theoretically, uh, we can prove that this, uh, that in the limit of very high q squared, that amplitude can be factorized into a hard perturbative part and then a soft component, which is parameterized by these uh, universal functions called, uh, called GPDs. However, experimentally, uh, the first question one needs to address is at which values of Q square uh, this is true, or at which values of Q square this is a good approximation, because we cannot, of course, reach Q square uh, equal infinity in, in, in the experiments. And this is important because if we are not in the right kinematic regime, then of course you can always measure the, the DVCS cross section, but you will not be able to make any legitimate extractions of GPDs out of the measurements. So the, this is why it's the first thing that one needs to check. Uh, otherwise, all, all the measurements are, are, may turn out to be uh, not so useful, or at least not, uh, not related uh, to GPDs. So, so Jefferson Lab is an experimental facility where we believe we can fulfill this, the kinematic conditions to study DVCS in the, in the right kinematic regime. So I know you already had a, a, an introduction about uh, Jefferson Lab by, by Thea at the, the first day, so, so I will not go into to any details here, of course. So this is just to remind you that the key features of uh, Jefferson Lab, as long as uh, this experimental program is, is concerned, is first the energy reach, so 6 GV and now 12 GV, uh, which allows to, to reach uh, relatively large values of Q square. And secondly, uh, the high intensity of the beam which allows one to, to run experiments at extremely high luminosities of the order of 10 to 38. And this is very important because the cross sections of DVCS, uh, DVCS reaction or exclusive reactions in general are very small. So in order to measure them uh, with high precision uh, and as a function of uh, multiple kinematic variables that you saw the GPDs depend on, uh, one needs a very high uh, luminosity. So there are DVCS and GPD experiments uh, in all three electron holes, A, B, and C. Uh, today I will be showing mostly results from, from uh, done in hole A, but tomorrow um, I will present some uh, currently uh, planned experiments also in hole B and hole C uh, in, the, in, the near, in the near future. So, each experiment has slightly different experimental setup, but, uh, but I give here a typical example of what has been frequently used in, in DVCS experiments in Hall A. Um, just to, to, to give you a, a feeling. So we want to, to detect all three particles in the final state. So the scatter electron, uh, uh, the emitted photon, and then the, the recoil proton. So for, for in Hall A for the scatter electron, we used one of the high resolution spectrometers in, in, in Hall A that I'm sure Thea described the first day. And so these high resolution spectrometers, they can measure the scatter electron very accurately. And this is important because the scatter electron is the one that determines the value of Q squared of the reaction and the variable of uh, X per kin, which is related to the variable of Xi of the quantum form factors of, of GPDs. So the, the, the high precision is obtained by a very large deflection. So you have here a very big um, dipole uh, that bends the electron uh, 45 degrees and they are detected uh, up here in the detector, uh, detector hat. Now to detect the, 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 the emitted photon and the recoil proton, we, we used some dedicated detectors. So an, an electromagnetic calorimeter uh, made of lead uh, fluoride crystals to detect the photon and an array of plastic anti air modules, uh, modules uh, to detect the, the recoil uh, proton. So a crucial part of the data analysis is to ensure that the sample of events um, are so-called fully exclusive, which means that we detect all three particles 
of the final state, and we make sure that uh, nothing else uh, was produced in the in the reaction for for those uh, for those events. So one. Uh, one way to do that is uh, one way to ensure that uh, this is uh, this is true is by verifying uh, the the energy momentum conservation of the detected particles. So usually one co construct the quantity known as uh, the proton uh, missing mass squared, which is defined by as the sum of the four momenta of of the initial electron and proton minus the four momentum of the uh, four momenta of the scattered electron and, and the emitted photon. Or that squared, so so that for, for DVCS events where the only remaining particle of the reaction is is the is the proton, the recoil proton. So this quantity should uh, should have a peak uh, at the proton mass squared, so, which is basically what you see uh, in this plot, uh, showing uh, in green and in green is the raw data where we only uh, detect the scatter electron and the photon. And then in black is shown after some background subtraction. Uh, in particular, this background is originated by pi zero decays, uh, which, as you all know, the, the pi zero decays into photons. If one of the photons is missed and you detect only one of them, uh, then the, the event looks very much like a DVCS event. So that you need to, to subtract those, those events. Um, but after you do that, uh, you see that the event distribution agrees very well with the fully exclusive events where all three particles are detected. The scatter electron, the photon, and the recoil proton. So these are the, um, the red uh, curves here. <coughs> um, so what, when the, the, the crosses, the red crosses are, are the experimental data, and then the, the, the red dots are uh, Monte Carlo simulation, so you see they, they all agree very well. So uh, of course, the experimental resolution is not perfect. So this peak has uh, has some width and some contamination from additional channels at higher values of the missing mass square that we need to avoid. So what we do is uh, to to apply a cut on the distribution as as indicated by the the vertical brown line here. So I won't, I won't go into the, the, any details of the data analysis in, the, in this lecture, but just I wanted to show at least one, one key plot before we go into the, into the results that illustrate the experimental uh, technique that uh, one uses to, to select uh, DVCS events. So now, um, what we measure at the end uh, is, of course, the cross-section of the reaction uh, as a function as, uh, of the angle phi that I described yesterday. It's a very important angle for this, uh, this reaction. So it's the angle between the leptonic and hadronic plane, so between the scattered and initial electron and the uh, hadron plane, which contains the photon and the, and the recoil proton. So at Jefferson Lab, we, we, we have a polarized electron beam, so we can easily make uh, elicit independent cross-section measurements, uh, which is what you see in the top panel here, but also the cross-section difference with opposite beams helicities. And, this, and that's what, we, what you see in the, in the bottom panel, both of them as a function of, of, of phi. Um, so in the, in the top plot, in the top panel, so you can see the, the, the data, of course, but also uh, the comparison with the beta Heiler process, uh, which, as I said yesterday, can be calculated uh, analytically in QED. And then we have fitted um, different contributions to the remaining part of the cross-section. So uh, once you remove the beta Heiler part, the rest that you can see uh, has a significant value, you can um, uh, fit uh, by different uh, azimuthal uh, components. And one thing that it's interesting first to note is that the beta hyalur dominates uh, the cross section at uh, phi close to zero, but at 180 degrees, uh, which corresponds to the, the case where uh, the virtual photon is further away from the scattered electron. In that, in that case, the beta hyalur cross section is, uh, is less than half of the total contribution. So, this is interesting because it means that there is uh, that this big difference uh, between the beta hyalur and the total cross section is going to contain information on GPDs that uh, that we want to extract. So the bigger this difference is, the more accurately we we can measure it. Uh, we can measure it. Um, 
as I mentioned yesterday, the DCS cross-section has a very rich azimuthal dependence. Uh, the interference term, uh, for example, has, two, uh, has a twist to contribution, uh, which has a constant term uh, plus a cos, uh, cos phi term. And it's shown here in red, uh, the fit. And there is also a high, higher twist contribution, which has a cos, a cos two phi term. Uh, so both the interference and this is very very small uh, as you can see here it turns out that uh, the amplitude uh, returned by the fit it uh, is almost uh, compatible with zero which is also a very interesting result um, because the, the fact that higher twist contributions appear to be small uh, and so the uh, it means that or at least hints to the fact that the process is uh, well described by the handback diagram that uh, I've been showing before in the previous slide and, uh, and yesterday. So this is also something confirmed in the bottom panel, which shows the difference of cross sections with opposite pink helicity, uh, which has a, a, a sinus phi term as, as the leading twist contribution, and then a higher twist contribution, which has, which has a sinus uh, two phi dependence, which is uh, much smaller than the, the twist two contribution. So, so one can extract all these different amplitudes as, uh, as a function of the angle phi. And uh, as I said at the beginning, one of the first uh, things we want to do is to check whether the Q square range of the reaction is, is high enough uh, in order to, uh, to access GPDs, uh, which basically means that we are scattering off a single part on, inside the nucleus. So for that to do that, one uh, one looks at the Q square dependence of, of these observables, um, and uh, it turns out to be roughly independent of Q square, which is a very strong indication of, of the scattering of a point like uh, particles, as we discussed in the in the case of TAS. So, so what we we show here is the amplitude of each of these azimuthal contributions. Uh, so the, the the DVC square term, and then some real parts of the interference term um, as a function of the uh, of the Q square. Um, however, one must still be very cautious, uh, of course, because as you can see also the Q square range in these plots is very limited. Uh, so it goes from basically 1.5 or 1.9 GV square to 2.3. So it's a very small level arm in, in Q square. So, so one would need to expand this to higher values of uh, Q square, which is now possible with the upgraded beam uh, of uh, JLab. Uh, but these this results I'm showing here are, are from the very um, few years ago. So, so they don't, do not benefit yet from the higher beam energies. These are uh, six GV uh, experiments where the Q square range, uh, as you see, it's, it's still very limited. But overall, it's a good, a good indication in favor of the handbag mechanism being a good description of, uh, of the DVCS uh, reaction. So one, one thing one usually uh, does next is to, to compare the results to models. Um, uh, and you can see here the, the comparison for, for several beams in, in T with a, a model developed in 2010. And you see that the model uh, underestimates significantly, I mean, at least systematically, the, the value of the, the measured cross sections. And so this, as I said, 2010 model, a little bit later in 2014, uh, some additional corrections to the DVCS uh, cross section were implemented. I mean, they were calculated and then implemented in the models. And these are higher twist uh, corrections known as uh, target mass corrections, for example, more generally power corrections because they are typically of the order of M square over Q square and uh, T over Q square, where M is the mass of, of the nucleus. So of the values of Q square of this data, which as I showed before, uh, are of the order of two, two GV squared, then the ratio M, M square over Q square is obviously not, uh, not negligible. So it turned out that, that by including these higher twist uh, corrections, uh, the cross sections uh, measured are much better described by the, by the theory. And of course the agreement is, is not perfect, but 
it indicates that while the handbag diagram uh, dominates the amplitude, it is not the only contribution that one needs to take into account to, to explain the, the, the experimental results. And that's, you can see, a, a very accurate uh, as a function of, of phi. So just to, to summarize a little bit some initial conclusions from these early DVCS experiments. Uh, so one is the fact that uh, the DVCS cross-section is uh, significantly larger than the beta hyalur. This was actually not expected at the beginning. People thought that uh, the only way one would access GPDs through DVCS would be through the interference term um, and, and not really through the DVCS square amplitude itself. But uh, that, uh, that's an interesting result that now we can, we have these two possibilities where GPDs enter uh, the interference term and the DVC square term, which turns out to be uh, significant. Second is the, the fact that the, as I showed the Q square dependence, <coughs> excuse me, of the different cross section terms indicates or hints to the dominance of the lead and twist contribution, uh, which is the handbag diagram. And finally, the fact that Nonetheless, to have an accurate description of the phi dependence, one, one may, may require to introduce higher order corrections uh, to the leading twist uh, diagram. So now how we can make progress uh, from, from these results. So, so what uh, happened next? Um, the second generation of experiments uh, on, on DVCS, what they tried to do is to exploit one additional dependence of the cross section. So in addition to the angle phi that uh, I saw, it's a very rich uh, dependence of the cross section. One can also use the beam energy dependence of the cross section. And this allows one to, to extract more information from, from the uh, DVCS. This is usually referred to as a Rosenbluth-like separation of the DVCS cross section because it reminds the, the same technique that um, is used to, in, uh, in the uh, destruction of uh, electric, electric and magnetic form factors of the nucleon by using a, a different beam energy to, uh, to separate them. So basically the idea here is, is to use the beam energy dependence in order to separate the DVC square contribution from the beta hyalur interference term. And given the fact that um, they have a different energy, uh, different dependence as a function of the beam energy, the, the interference term goes as a power of three with the beam energy, which is noted here by, by K. And the DVC square term goes as a, fun, as a power of two with the beam energy K. So one then, uh, what do we do is we, we can measure the cross section as exactly the same kinematics, but at two different values of the beam energy. And then uh, we, what we try to do here is to make a combined fit of both results. So both cross sections uh, at, the same, at the same kinematics, but two different values of the beam energy, which as you see, they are not very different because again, this is a six GV experiment, uh, but it, it turned out already. So the, the, the best fit is the, that you can do with taking into account both data sets. Uh, is the, the red dotted line here. It, as you see, it turns out that, uh, so it's a leading twist, leading order fit, and it cannot reproduce very well the phi dependence of the cross sections, so especially the, the, the one here at high beam energy. Now, to improve that, um, so that's, that was already an, an interesting uh, fact that the, 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 the leading twist fit, uh, leading order cannot reproduce uh, both cross sections simultaneously uh, to try uh, to improve the fit when one may try to include then um, higher order contributions. So this can be either higher twist contributions like the one represented here in this diagram where an additional gluon couples um, between the top and the bottom part of the diagram or next to leading order contributions like uh, the one uh, shown here where a, a gluon couples to the, uh, to the photon through a quark loop. I think yesterday was actually a question. Someone was asking how, how to probe uh, GPDs of, of, of gluons. Uh, so this is a leading twist diagram, but it's next to leading order in now phase. So these are uh, another kind of uh, higher order corrections. 
So if we include uh, some of these terms uh, in the fit, then uh, either uh, higher twist or NLO um, Compton form factors, then you see that the blue line now here, it reproduces much better the phi dependence of the cross section. And actually both scenarios uh, produce a almost identical result, an, an identical fit. Either um, including leading twist um, contributions or, uh, sorry, leading twist plus higher twist contributions or leading twist plus any low terms, both fits uh, are good and are equally good actually, they, they really overlap. So, so the conclusion of this exercise actually is that the higher order corrections are needed but it is not possible at this point, at least with this data, to tell whether they're, they're higher twist or, or next to leading order corrections that, uh, that are needed. Or of course, some combination of both, which is most likely uh, the case, right? So at this point, what we, we can go ahead and do, so, uh, so to speak, is, the, is this separation in the two scenarios. And so, um, you remember that the goal was to actually separate the interference from the DVC square term. So we can we can assume uh, either higher twist or NLO contributions and then do the separation in, in under these conditions. <coughs> and you can see here the separation one obtains. So, so in the left uh, panel, uh, we see the helicity independent cross section. And in the right panel shows the helicity dependent cross section, the cross section difference with the opposite being, being helicity. So, so the red bands uh, show first um, the, the, the NLO scenario, which uh, with the solid line showing the DVC square contribution and the dotted line, dotted line the, the interference. And the blue bands show the, the equivalent thing, but in the higher twist uh, scenario. Um, and you see that the, the two scenarios show similar trends. They, they are not completely different uh, contributions. But there are, however, some significant differences in some cases, right? Especially in, in the right uh, in the right panel uh, here, which shows the helicity dependent cross section. For example, in this case, the DVC square contribution is zero uh, in the case of the NLO scenario, but it has a significant size uh, in the case of um, of the higher twist scenario. So how, uh, however, with the, this data alone, we, these two scenarios cannot be distinguished, at least uh, not experimentally. So, so to do this separation properly, one would actually need a beam of, of positrons uh, to combine a beam of electrons uh, with the beam of electrons currently available at JLab. And this is actually, uh, uh, the goal of a future experiment that was proposed uh, actually very recently last year. Um, and the physics motivation is actually to the fact that the, the, the sign of the interference term, uh, I didn't mention that before, but it depends on the sign of the charge of the, light, of, of the beam. Uh, so for, for an electron, it will have a, a, a positive uh, sign here. And for a positron, you will have a negative sign here. So. So by simply measuring, simply, I mean, you still need to get a positron beam, of course, but if it is available, uh, you can measure the cross section with electrons, with positrons, and you can very cleanly uh, separate uh, these two terms uh, of the cross section. You can see, you can see here some uh, some projections of uh, what one could do by measuring DVCS cross section uh, cross sections with uh, positrons in, in red, uh, with electrons in, in magenta. And then by subtracting them, one would get basically twice the interference term, and then adding them, one gets twice the DVC square term. Uh, of course, previous, you previously removed the contribution from the beta Heidler, which uh, again is, is well known. And you can see that we can do that very accurately. You can even hardly see the, the error bars in this uh, simulated uh, data point. Now, as, as I just said, and you already know already, um, uh, there is currently no positron beam available at Jefferson Lab, but people are already starting uh, thinking about it and figure out what one 
may need to do to, to make it happen. So, so you see here uh, a, ba a basic uh, design of the injector modifications that would be needed. And uh, I won't go into the details, but the basic idea to, to, to make a positron beam is to use the electron beam currently available and to make it uh, a scatter of, um, of a target and then uh, uh, recover uh, the positrons uh, that are produced. Of course, the, amounts of, the amount of positrons produced that way is, is much less than the initial electron current, right? So, so there is a, a positron beam current will be uh, much smaller in principle than the one available right now with electrons. So that's basically the things that need to be studied and quantified uh, in order to know what, what would be the positron beam current that can be achieved uh, in the future. So anyway, this is still a little far in the future, but maybe not that far. And, and certainly uh, the best way to, to make a clean separation of uh, the DVC squared and the interference term with the beta halo. So uh, up to now, so I've been describing um, mainly DVCs of the proton uh, using a hydrogen, hydrogen target. So in, in, the, in the remaining part of uh, this lecture, uh, I'd like now to show what has been done with neutrons. Of course, the goal of measuring uh, DVCs of neutrons uh, is, well, the ultimate goal is to, to flavor separate the, the different DPDs. I uh, have maybe not mentioned this ex explicitly a lot up to now, but of course, GPDs are defined for each flavor of quarks. So by combining data from protons and neutrons uh, that have different uh, quant quark content uh, and neglecting, if you neglect the contributions from strange quarks, uh, then you can separate the quark U and the quark D contributions uh, to the proton GPDs or neutron GPDs. So now DVCS of the neutron is also interesting because um, we one would be sensitive to slightly different GPDs than in the case of the proton. For example, if we look at, um, at one particular combination of GPDs that uh, appear in the helicity dependent cross sections, it turns out that um, so it's, it has this combination of GPDs H, H still, and E. It turns out that while this combination is dominated by the GPD H in the case of a proton, it is mostly sensitive to GPD E in the case of a neutron. And this is because the values of the kinematic terms in front of these uh, GPDs, uh, which here are the, the values of the form factors, so basically F1 and F2, uh, they change drastically between proton and neutron. So in the case of a neutron, the form factor F2 is much higher than F1, uh, which is uh, the opposite actually in the case of a proton target. So the experimental setup is uh, to measure DVCS of the neutron is very similar, uh, except that we typically do not detect the neutron, uh, which is something very difficult to do, but ensure the exclusivity of uh, exclusivity of the reaction by means of the missing mass uh, technique that I, uh, that I explained at, uh, at the beginning of, of this lecture. Now, the very first measurement of DBCS of the neutron dates back to 2007, um, uh, where only the helicity dependent cross section was measured. And it was actually found to be compatible with zero within uncertainty. So, uh, it was a measurement where really uh, the conclusion was that the, the, cr the cross section was too small to be measured. Um, this still is allowed to, to, to put some constraints in models and parameterizations of GPDs, as, as you can see here. But this physics extraction of uh, what you can do is somewhat limited when you, when you measure such a small cross section. Uh, the total cross section, the, the helicity independent cross section, could could not actually be measured um, for that experiment for several experimental issues and in particular uh, calibration drifts in the detectors uh, between the data periods, uh, periods running DVCs of the neutron and of the proton that you need both uh, to, to actually uh, subtract them. So there were some improvements um, that were made uh, in the experimental setup. Um, 
and the new experiment uh, ran uh, more recently uh, trying to measure DVCs of the neutron. One, one big improvement um, was the, uh, and very simple actually, it was to interleave uh, the periods of running with hydrogen target and deuterium targets because you need to do the subtraction of these two to make to extract the contribution from the neutron. Um, another more involved um, improvement um, was the upgrade of the detectors to a bigger size, um, uh, larger acceptance, which in turn, in turn makes the background subtraction uh, much easier and more, much more accurate. So these are the, the, the main two um, upgrades um, of the experiment in order to to try again to measure um, DVCs of the neutron, which is uh, which is also very something very challenging. So let me um, uh, now show uh, the results of this upgraded experiment. Um, first of all, uh, a few words again on the experimental technique, uh, which is uh, a little bit more uh, evolved for for this uh, neutron measurements, uh, as as you all know. Neutron targets do not exist, of course. So one usually uses a, a deuterium target as a quasi-free uh, neutron target. Um, however, one gets obviously contributions from protons too in the deuterium. Uh, those you can subtract by 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 measuring uh, same thing with the hydrogen target. But you can also get coherent DVCs of uh, deuterons themselves. So, so that's the case where the deuterium stays intact and recoils. Uh, which is a channel uh, different from the one in principle we are mostly interested in, which is the one scattering off a single neutron um, of the deuteron. Um, so once you, you subtract the proton events, you, you are left out with these two contributions in your data sample, uh, which are different to distinguish, uh, the one from the neutron and the one from the deuteron. If you look at the missing mass distribution, um, and you compute the position of events that you would expect in, you would expect in the spectrum, you realize that uh, there is a slight kinematical shift. Uh, if you compute the missing mass of DVCS of the deuteron, assuming the, uh, a recoil mass of uh, the, new, uh, the neutron, then the deuteron events uh, will peak at slightly smaller values of the missing mass. And the, there is a small shift, which is actually given by the, the kinematics, uh, and it's equal to, to t over two, basically. Um, and t, uh, you remember, is the, the value of the momentum transfer uh, to, to the proton. So, so unfortunately, this shift is not large enough to observe two distinct peaks in the spectrum. However, one can use the fact that the position of the peaks are, are well known and then fit two different peaks to the total uh, data sample. So this is uh, what you see here. Uh, the blue histogram shows the contribution uh, uh, to the total uh, sample from uh, neutrons and the magenta peak uh, shows uh, the events that are attributed to the coherent DVCs of the neutron. As you, as you can see, the separation is not easy. Uh, which in practice uh, translates into big correlations, uh, correlation uncertainties in the results. Uh, and uh, you will see that in the, in, in the next uh, uh, slides. So here are the, the results um, one gets as a function of, of the angle phi uh, for both uh, the neutron in blue and the deuteron in magenta for different values of uh, T from top to bottom. In the bottom, uh, which corresponds to the smallest value of t, there is almost no separation between these two peaks. Uh, and then, then the, 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 the correlation is basically 100%. And this is the, why the, the bands, the systematic, uh, uh, sorry, the, the statistical uncertainty is so big. Uh, however, a larger T on the top, and there is a significant separation and a good determination, relatively good determination of the cross sections. So, oops, sorry. Um, so, despite the, the large uh, error bars, again, related to correlations and, and not so much to, to pure uh, statistical uncertainties, um, this is indeed the first observation of uh, DVCS of the neutrons. So, this is not compatible with zero anymore, as I showed before. 
on the in the initial experiment and, and these were uh, only recently published so you see the results date uh, from from last year now you can get a slightly nicer plots if you integrate over phi and then you look at the t dependence of uh, of the cross section and um and you can you can see here uh, that the uncertainties are, are now much much smaller, and, uh, and we can easily see a significant value of of the cross section uh, beyond the the value of the of the beta Heidler cross section, which is uh, here uh, shown by, by by the dotted lines. Uh, you, you can also see that models have troubles reproducing the data, um, especially in the in the case of of the neutron. Uh, the blue points, um, but there, there are not that that many models yet that have implemented this. Uh, well, that they, they, they produce uh, results uh, predictions for for neutron, as uh, there are so so few experiments yet that uh, that have uh, measured uh, DVCs of the neutron. So, and and the results, uh, as you as I said, are, are still very recent. So I'm, I'm confident that. Uh, models will uh, will be constrained by this data and will make a better job in, in a few years from now. So as I said before, one of the, the main goals um, of the measurements of, uh, of DVCs of the neutron is, is to do a separation of uh, GPDs or, or Compton form factors, to be more precise, uh, by combining data collected on the proton and on the neutron. So I show here the, the, the results of uh, this extraction, uh, where uh, you see uh, in red, you see the results from the down quark and in blue uh, from the up quark. And if each, each of the panels show uh, one particular Compton form factor. So uh, the real uh, part on the, on the left, the imaginary part of the, on the right, you have the Compton form factor H and uh, the top panel, then H tilde, again, uh, real and imaginary part, and on the central panel, and then the bottom shows uh, Compton form factor E, uh, real part and imaginary part. So again, the uncertainties are, are, are uh, large and this, uh, for this first measurement, uh, but uh, as I said, they are related more though, to correlations in the structure from uh, neutron from coherent neutron than, than actually from the pure statistical uh, uncertainties of, of, of the event sample. Uh, so still uh, larger, but uh, we, we, we see some general trends and sometimes they're, they are well reproduced by models. So you can see the, the models are, are the, solid, uh, the solid lines here. But not uh, not always not for all the Compton form factors. So still, there's uh, some some work uh, to do to understand um, some this data. So I think th this uh, this is basically what uh, I wanted to to show to you today this in this lecture. So that I think that brings me uh, to to my summary. Um, so, so I have reviewed some some selected results on on DVCs uh, from JLab. And of course, there are many others, uh, and uh, we'll be describing a little bit more uh, uh, tomorrow uh, some other results of uh, JLab and also in other facilities. But today, I wanted to to concentrate as an introduction on the ones from from Jefferson Lab. Um, so here are a few conclusions that uh, we can draw from the, the, the measurements uh, I discussed today. So first, um, DVC experimental data shows uh, indications of uh, leading twist uh, dominance and, and that at uh, relative low values of Q square, maybe lower than one would naively expect of the order of uh, two GV square, uh, already we see some kind of uh, Q square independence on, on the results. Um, however, we also saw that the data, uh, which is also, uh, now ve very precise, and, um, to fully describe the data and the zimital dependence of the data, we, we have shown that we usually need to include higher order terms, uh, higher twist corrections or next to, le next to leading order contributions uh, to, 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 the, 
to the cross-section. We have also seen how exploiting the beam energy dependence of the cross-section, one can partially separate the contributions from DVC square term and the beta hyler DVCS interference. Um, but ultimately, as, uh, as I explained, uh, one would want to do that. If we want to do this cleanly, uh, one would need to, to use a positron beam, uh, which may be available in, in a few years from now, but uh, it's not yet available. So, so right now, the, the separation, uh, uh, as you saw, still uh, depends on different scenarios. So it's, it's not completely um, clean uh, as one would be able to do with positrons. And then finally, in the last part of the lecture, uh, so we have discussed the VCS of the, of the neutron and in particular shown the, the first results of cross sections and that, uh, that were published uh, recently. And uh, we have used them uh, combined with DVCS of the proton in order to make a, a flavor separation of the Compton from factors. So I think I will stop here for this lecture and then uh, I'll be happy to take uh, questions. You've been very quiet, so I hope you're still there. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I see the, there are already some questions. So uh, Caleb, please, if you want. Uh, yes, um, this may not be that important, but on slide 18 on the plot, um, what is the light blue line? Oh, this is the systematic uncertainty. So, yeah, so the, 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 the little bars here that you hardly see are, are statistical uncertainty. And then at the top, it shows the, this uh, systematic uncertainty, projected systematic uncertainty of the measurement. So basically, uh, the, the, the meaning is that the systematic is comparable to the statistical uncertainty. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, yeah. <laughs> I think there is a Daniel, Adamiak. Yes, thank you. Um, so dumb question, but I'm not super familiar with twist expansion. So could you speak a little bit about the physical interpretation of twist expansions and how they compare to uh, coupling expansions? So the physical uh, interpretation I can give you is basically, uh, can use maybe this plot. So the 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 leading twist will so basically it's the number of partons that are involved in the it's related to the number of partons that are involved in the in the reaction. And so the, the leading twist you will have one parton only. So this uh, it turns out to be twist two. Uh, higher twists will have higher partons. So here you have two for twist three and so on and so forth. So that's, so that's the very basic uh, physical meaning as an experimentalist um, that I can give you. Um, I don't know if that's uh, too simple for you or <laughs> that's the, um, basically it's related to the number of uh, constituents that are uh, involved in the, in the scattering of the, in the scattering amplitude. But doesn't that include extra powers of alpha s for every vertex that you're including now? Well, that's that's another kind of corrections, right? So this is the, the, the NLO uh, or next to leading order or next next to leading order. So so these kind of diagrams, so this one here, you can see still only one part of the nucleon uh, is uh, involved in the reaction. So it's still leading twist, but you have uh, higher powers of alpha, alpha s. So that's why it's... Um, and they low. Okay, but if you, and of course you, can, to, you can have both. Yeah, so if you go to higher twist and you have more particles because they couple to the reaction, that's also necessarily uh, higher power. Yes, you will have higher powers of uh, alpha s involved mm -hmm. too. Yes, but uh, this one. Okay. You're right, but this one doesn't have a higher twist, but you still have the right okay cool thank you okay thank you very much for your question next we have uh, andrew no? 
Hey, sorry if you answered this already. Uh, on slide 25, I noticed that the uncertainties for the down quarks for the real and imaginary parts of the Compton form factor were pretty consistently a lot larger than for the up quarks. Is there a reason why it's harder to shrink that uncertainty for the down quark measurements? Well, the, the main reason is that um, the data, so you combine proton and, and neutron data, right? Uh, to do that. And the uncertainty on the proton data is much smaller. And it turns out that the proton has two up quarks. So that's why the up quarks are best constrained because they, they're usually uh, constrained uh, from the proton data, which is more accurate. That's the, the, the rough uh, argument. Then, as I said, most of it comes from correlation. So it, it doesn't follow that rule strictly every everywhere but that's the, the main reason cool thank you okay we have uh, another question by kelly uh hi uh first of all a really nice talk thank you very much um my question's kind of a, a natural lead on from i think it was daniel's uh i guess um, apologies if this is extremely trivial, but um, you mention a lot of times that it's um, higher order contributions are sort of your leading twist or the lead, like next to leading order. Is why is it not natural to assume that it would be a mix of both? Like why is it kind of tested for if it's one or the other rather than naturally being a mixture? No, no, you're right. So, so it would probably be a mixture, right? So, so mm -hmm. um, what we did, uh, so it was we just took some kind of two extreme examples, right? So, so the the, the conclusion was that leading twist leading order doesn't work. So, what would one do? It's first let's try only including a higher twist, and it works. <laughs> then only including any low contribution also works. Um, and we cannot tell which is the uh, which one it is. Uh, most likely, as you say, in real, uh, what is happening probably is a combination of both. But we cannot even tell already. Assuming the two extremes, uh, there is no way to tell. So, uh, yes, yeah, so you can't discern be, like yeah. yeah, which one's more than the other. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Next, uh, um, I think we have a uh, Luca with another question, if you want to. Okay, hi. Uh, actually, I have a really probably naive question, but uh, in uh, slide eight and also 18, you show that the twist to um, deep virtual compound scattering is basically flat. You can uh, actually give us a naive interpretation of why is it? Why the, there is no fee dependence. Maybe I interpreted it wrong, but. Well, it is not exactly true. It is flat here. Okay. Uh, and that's the, at leading twist, uh, that's, uh, that's true. Uh, at leading twist, uh, DVC is, is flat, but it has, uh, as, as it says here, uh, I didn't. Uh, so it has also a high, mm -hmm. a, a cosinus phi term uh, that okay. enters, uh, but in principle, it's it's higher twist. So it's it's not. I, I don't think I can give you a very intuitive um, argument because actually uh, this is a, a little bit an oversimplification. Once when you look at exactly how this enters, most of these coefficients they both they all are mixed in terms of twists so there is not such a clean um, separation between the phi dependence and the twist uh, so this is uh, okay. some kind of uh, simplification the dominance contributions but uh, strictly speaking uh, each of these terms have all twist contributions <laughs> These are the, the dominant uh, contributions, uh, the twist to dominant contributions, twist three dominant contribution, but actually everything mixes a little bit uh, uh, when you do the, when you look at the equations uh, precisely. Okay, 
Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, also Andrew William has uh, raised his hand. So please, if you have a question, go ahead. Yeah, so are these measurements only sensitive to valence quarks or do you have to also worry about uh, the C quarks? Are we like at a high enough X range that it's, that we're really only probing the, the valence quarks in the nucleon? So, so you're right, at, the, at these values of X were mostly dominated by, by the valence quarks. Uh, so I, I will show a little bit, uh, I think it's later today. So, so when you do some global fits of, of, uh, of the data, you can you can have some sensitivity to, to, to lower X. And then what will be uh, more interesting is if you wanna look at the lower X is to, to go to some kinematics of, of collider kinematics. And I will touch on that at the, at the la last lecture. But yes, these values of X are basically, uh, JLab is uh, between 0.3 and point six, I would say, uh, we're mostly sensitive to, to valence quarks. So that's why I usually refer to, to, to quarks only. But Okay. Yeah, I guess I was just wondering because you're, you're, you're using the neutron and the proton to separate out the different uh, flavor dependence. But if you're in the, the C quark region where you have strange possibility to worry about. And right, right, right. Yeah. So, so the separation, as I said, it also needs to assume you, you neglect the strange quarks, which is a reasonable assumption is in the valence quark region, but no, not everywhere, of course. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we also have a question by the organizer. So please ask it if you want. Yeah, good morning, Carlos. Thanks a lot for the really nice and clear to follow lecture. <laughs> So I was wondering about the positron beam experiment. So I know this is in the makings and probably there are almost no details yet. I was wondering if you could say a little bit how the experimental setup would look like. So things as what would the target be? How would you uh, redirect the positrons that are created into a beam? Things like this. Yes. Yeah, so so the setup, it's a very brute force setup. Uh, so you, you send an, an electron beam into a target and then you, you get a lot of stuff out of it. And then you try to recover the, the few positrons that are produced. Um, so there is a, a big loss of intensity, but okay, that you can compensate by maybe increasing your, uh, your density of the electron, initial electron beam. Uh, so then the, the, the main issue later is uh, how to accelerate it, uh, and that's not part of this diagram, how to accelerate them into the machine of, of uh, Jefferson Lab, because the, the, the positron beam uh, will not have necessarily uh, the, the same um, emittance than the electron uh, beam. So the emittance is basically the, 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 the dispersion in momentum um, so if if it's too large, uh, basically your your magnets and your uh, your the optics of the accelerator are not compatible with the one we have already in place for for electrons. So that the, the main issue is uh, the 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 emittance of the beam that we are pro that are is created this way by just bombarding a, a, a an electron beam into a target. And then a little bit less important also is the 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 energy spread. So all the all the positrons may not have the exactly the same energy or at close of an energy as the the electron beam. So that can also have some some implications for for experiments. Um, but the main challenge basically is that uh, well you need to to change mo most of the magnets in the machine. That uh, of course they are. Uh, there are uh, for <laughs> negative charge. So you need to either uh, change the power supplies. Uh, basically there are a lot of magnets in the machine that needs to be changed. So it's a, it's a big upgrade, um, but it doesn't look very complicated uh, technically. Most of it is uh, a matter of, um, you know, uh, I would say, um, 
budget money. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's an upgrade of the machine, but uh, I don't think there is a, a technical showstopper that uh, would prevent it. Okay, thanks. So the idea would be probably to uh, keep all the magnets for the original electron beam, and then after that hits the target to have a magnet substitute or the current change, as you said, for the positron part. Right, the idea would be, I th okay, you, you can change the magnet, but you, you could probably uh, just change the power supply. So you will run with uh, the, the electrons with one polarity, and then you, you, you need to stop for, for a few weeks, maybe a, a few months. You reversed everything in the machine, and then you can run positrons. So, so it's not something that you can run simultaneously or, or even very close to each other. You, you still need a significant downtime to, um, to do the change. But uh, yeah, that's something just to, to, to schedule in advance. OK, that's interesting. And one final follow-up question. So about the luminosity loss of positrons versus electrons. I don't have any idea about the order of magnitude. Is it more like 50 percent, 10 percent, 1 percent? Uh, it's it's more like one percent, I would say. Uh, uh, yeah. So so it depends also uh, on, on the polarization. So um, if you really want, because uh, there is a, a transfer, so you you get a lot less positrons, of course, this way. But ideally, you want them also to be polarized. So you go, you you use an electron beam which is polarized. And the interesting thing that uh, we measure, they measured uh, basically in this paper here is that the positron beam that you get is also polarized, slightly polarized, not a lot. So there is a polarization transfer um, that depends on the intensity too. So, so if, if you get, if you want polarized beam, uh, then the, the, the ratio is even less. So it's maybe 10 to the minus four. Uh, uh, the intensities of uh, polarized positron beam compared to the polarized electron beam. Now, if you don't care so much about the, the polarization, then it's probably a factor of 1%. So, so it's a big loss in, in, in intensity. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot for bearing with me. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Okay, nice. And uh, we also have a question by Arun. Hi, Carlos. Fantastic talk. Uh, again, it was very nice. I have a couple of questions and actually one quick comment uh, just to give, uh, just to you know, follow up on Astrid's question. Typically, if the electron beam is of the order of, I don't know, 50 micrograms or something like that, that hits uh, that uh, emittance filter and then the system, uh, you get nanoamps uh, worth of positrons out. Right, so that's order of three already that's getting affected. And you, if you want polarized positrons to come out, then as Carlos correctly pointed out, into the minus four. So microamps becomes few nanoamps. That's uh, what has to be taken into consideration is the statistical significance that you need to achieve, how long you have to run this way to get there, right? So that just a follow up comment. So, um, okay, so quick question, Carlos. Um, first is, um, I, I guess theorists have uh, had uh, quite a bit of a success, but mm, again, there are more puzzles that had to be explained because initially, uh, you know, you had shown that uh, these twist three contributions were very small, but after including target mass corrections, they were able to explain the cross sections. But again, on data, it doesn't, models don't really agree that well with uh, uh, with the T dependence of the data. So I was wondering if, there in, if there's any specific aspect that people have been curious about as to why it doesn't agree, perhaps nuclear effects or if there's anything specific that they're looking into. Um, yeah, so that's uh, one question. Yeah, okay. So it's a little uh, general question. No, I don't think that there's... Um... So, so what... Theorists are, are mostly interested uh, to do is, uh, I mean, they, they can, they, they can if they try very hard to, to reproduce one particular set of data, one particular beam kinematics and so on. What is harder uh, is to reproduce uh, multiple data at the different kinematics and different experiments and, 
Um, so I, I will show a little bit, uh, I think it's also later today, um, what can be done and, and the, the, the status of that. And you'll see it's, it, it is challenging. It is challenging to, uh, because of, uh, you know, all models have some free parameters that you can adjust and you can fit uh, one particular set of data, but then of course um, it doesn't work everywhere. Um, but for, for, for DVCS, I think the, the, on the proton, which is dominated by GPDH, the, 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 the agreement of data and, and, and models is reasonable. I mean, it's of course, as I showed, it doesn't fully describe the phi dependence and, and things like that. So I think the, the goal is, is more to, to go to higher twist and higher, uh, higher order corrections in models. So, so far, uh, models only include uh, the leading twist contribution. Uh, there are no models, uh, to my knowledge, that uh, model the, the, the twist three GPDs. Uh, so these are the kind of things that uh, need need to be implemented. Uh, NLO, higher twist corrections, um, I would say. And then there are some GPDs that are less sensitive um, and they're and very well, very uh, badly known like uh, GPDE and E tilde. These are very, very hard to, to model because there are no, no forward limit. Uh, so there's uh, less constraints uh, theoretically uh, less data experimentally to, to, to constrain them. I don't know if that answers a little bit your, your question. Yeah, yes, certainly. It, it is a challenging problem. And, yeah. um, and also I was wondering for the proton data has a, uh, you said that one of the goals was to do this kind of a flavor separation and perhaps have, uh, have there been any comparisons with say, for example, Marathon, DORU and um, or bonus, for example, the you in the longitudinal direction. In principle, we should get there. I mean, or we should be able to acquire those or interconnect. I mean, we should be able to connect these two viewpoints. Right? Well, there are the forward limit of GPDs are, 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 are those ones, right? Um, whether there've been comparisons, um, you mean models that, that take into account both data sets, is that? Because that's that's what you would uh, need, right? I mean, you cannot compare directly the data because they 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 are not uh, the same thing. But through a model, you could see if models reproduce both data sets. Basically, that's what I would. Um, yeah. Right. One. So, one so by one construction, one. all GPD models reproduce the the forward um, limit, right? Um, but now this forward limit uh, changes <laughs> when new data is available, right? So, so, so I don't think the models uh, take into account right now the, the, the data you, you, you mentioned from the marathon, right? So, so these are uh, very recent, but, uh, but yes, it would, be, it would be interesting to, to, to see if, if results are compatible through a model that uh, try to reproduce both uh, data sets. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I don't know if uh, Kali is still uh, the previous question or you have a new one. I think it's a new one, right? Sorry, no, it wasn't. Uh, I hadn't okay. moved my hand. My apologies. No problem. Okay, then uh, looks like uh, we don't have any more questions, not even in the chat or on Slack. So this concludes the second lecture and uh, we will be back in uh, 20 minutes for the third part of this series on BCS. See you soon. Very good. See you in 20 minutes. Bye. Yes.
Hello, Carlos. Welcome back. Hello. So I had to slightly change my setup. Um, I'm on a different computer now. So I cannot go full, totally full screen, but I hope this is big enough. You can see the slide, OK? Yep, we can see him. Yeah, okay. So it's just the top part that is, it's not full screen, but it's a different computer. I have issues here. Anyway, um, so whenever, okay, we can wait one more minute, I guess. Yes. I think it's, it's about time if you want, well. Very good, okay. So welcome back again to so lecture number three, um, the last one of today for me, not for you guys, but. <laughs> um, so let uh, first um, uh, remind you the, the outline. So, so I rearrange a little bit the uh, lecture three and lecture four. So uh, lecture three today, we will uh, discuss uh, deeply virtual meson production and GPD models that I previously had on lecture four uh, yesterday. Now, I wanted to give a little bit more space in lecture four for uh, describing the uh, different experiments beyond uh, Jefferson Lab. Uh, so that's, uh, that's interesting for you, you guys to get a, um, a more broader um, perspective. So I will uh, squeeze the, the model and parameterizations uh, into today's lecture, the second part. I mean, it's gonna be, short as, as, as you guys know, uh, I'm mostly as experimentalist, but I think uh, it's important to, uh, of course, um, um, have feeling of uh, what's on, on the market for, for models uh, right now. So um, as I said, this, this lecture will be divided in two parts. Um, um, first, I will describe deeply virtual uh, Mason production, uh, how this uh, channel can be used to, to access uh, GPDs. And then the second part uh, will be dedicated to, to modeling uh, GPDs and fits to, to, to experimental uh, data. Oh, uh, oh, sorry. Um, so deeply virtual Mason production is uh, very similar. Uh, it's a very similar channel to, to DVCS, except um, that instead of a photon in the final state, uh, we have a meson here. And it can be uh, many kind of uh, mesons. Uh, in this diagram, I, I show a pi zero because uh, it will be the channel that I will uh, mostly be describing today, but other mesons are possible uh, like uh, phi or eta or even heavier mesons like uh, jpsi and, and so on. So, so actually varying the, mes and the meson, uh, we can probe uh, different flavors of GPDs because there will be different uh, GPDs appearing here. So uh, and this is one of the main advantages of using uh, meson production in general compared to, to, to DVCS. So for example, if, if you compare here the, the flavor content of a pi zero, for example, with the flavor content of a pi, uh, proton, sorry, um, you see that one can uh, have uh, used that to, to separate the, the flavor of GPD. So the GPD H tilde, for example, that one will measure with a pi zero, will have this kind of uh, flavor content or flavor weights, um, which are uh, different from the ones that uh, one would measure in H tilde. Well, this should be a tilde here, H tilde DVCS, which will have a different weight in, in front of uh, HU and HT. Um, so uh, as in the case of um, DVCS, that's sufficiently uh, high Q square, uh, the amplitude of this diagram can be factorized into to a hard perturbative part and a soft component, um, which depends on GPDs, the same GPDs as in DVCS, so these are universal functions. However, here, not all GPDs appear, uh, like in the case of DVCS. So depending on the meson, you will have different, uh, different kinds of GPDs. So for pi zero, but you get uh, H tilde and E tilde. 
Um, and this is, of course, a leading twist, uh, uh, higher twists. Uh, you will have a more, more GPD centering. But so now the important uh, point here that I wanted to note is that um, this factorization um, only applies in the case of uh, a longitudinally polarized virtual form. Um, so this is very important. If, uh, if you do this rigorously with a transverse polarized uh, photon, you get divergences, so infinities that uh, you are not able to, to regularize, and you are not able basically to factorize the, the, the amplitude at least. And no one managed to do it yet. So, so the proper uh, factorization uh, only um, happens with uh, longitudinally uh, polarized uh, photons. Um, so now, as a function of, um, sorry, uh, um, when one looks at the, um, the, the amplitude, the longitudinal amplitude on, on, uh, at the high Q square, uh, you, you can uh, show that the longitudinal cross section goes as a, fa as a fa function of one over Q square, uh, Q to the six, whereas the transverse amplitude has a higher power of uh, Q square. So the transverse cross section has uh, two orders of uh, two, two powers uh, higher of Q square. So it goes as uh, Q to the eight. So at sufficiently uh, high Q square, uh, the transverse cross section should be much smaller than the longitudinal cross section. So, so the, uh, the, the meson production cross section is expected by QCD uh, to be dominated at high Q square by the longitudinal components. So you can see here, uh, again, the, the same diagram, uh, the usual invariance Q square X W that will, that are common to DVCS also. Of course, one disadvantage of meson production compared to DVCS, we, we usually say that DVCS is the cleanest process is because uh, you have in DVCS a, a photon in the final state, whereas of course here you have a pion, which includes some additional unknown. So you have the distribution amplitude of the, of the pion uh, that, uh, that plays a role. And uh, one question is, what are the values of Q square where this, uh, this factorization applies? Because you, you have some additional gluon here also that, that may make this uh, factorization to, to apply the, the, the higher values of, of Q square. So anyway, this is something, as I said, for, for the case of DVCS that someone need, uh, one needs to, to, to test uh, experimentally. So, so measure these cross sections uh, uh, first separately, sigma L, sigma T, look at the Q square dependence and then uh, see uh, whether we are in the, in the regime uh, that is predicted uh, where factorization is, uh, is expected. So I put here, so for, for uh, the longitudinal uh, amplitude, uh, uh, it has uh, this kind of uh, shape. So it has the distribution amplitude of the meson times this uh, Compton form factor, so the GPDs uh, convoluted uh, with this uh, kernel. And in the case of a pi zero, for example, you have H tilde and E tilde uh, with some kinematic factors in, in front of them. So now um, to study uh, this, so you need to first uh, look at the, each of the terms. As I said, it's important to, to check whether the photon is polarized longitudinally or transversely. Um, if you look at the cross section as a function of phi um, for uh, meson production, it has this uh, kind of expression. So it has a constant term where you have both transverse and longitudinal cross section. <clears throat> um, however, there is a, an epsilon here, which is related to the beam energy. So there is a way to separate these two cross sections, uh, again, it's very similar to what happened to DVCS. You can use the phi dependence to separate most of the terms. Uh, some of them you cannot, but you can use the, um, uh, the Rosenbluth technique, which is changing the beam energy, changing epsilon, and measuring this at the same kinematics uh, to extract separately sigma t and sigma l. Uh, the phi dependence helps you to, to separate the, the other terms, which are interference. Um, cross sections and so now interference, meaning uh, interference uh, amplitude between the transversely polarized photons and the longitudinally polarized photons. So it's a different interference uh, compared to the one I was describing uh, for, for the VCS. Um, and that one you can extract by simply uh, fitting the cross section to the different terms of uh, the phi distribution. 
So you have Cosinus phi term, which is uh, sigma TL, transverse longitudinal interference. Um, Cosinus two phi, transverse transverse interference, because uh, the photon can be, uh, there are two, or two directions where the photon can be transverse, right? Uh, it's a plane. Um, and then this uh, sigma TL prime, uh, which is uh, basically depending on the being helicity. So this is what uh, I was calling for DVCS uh, helicity dependent cross section. So when you do the cross section difference with different being helicities, all these other terms will cancel and you will be sensitive to this interference term uh, sigma TL prime. So you have H here is the being helicity. And again, you have the epsilon, which depends on the, on the B metric. So these are the kind of kinematic uh, dependencies that you're going to, to, to exploit uh, to, again, uh, try to, to access each of the terms independently. So these are uh, some, uh, some results uh, very recently. Actually, they are, they are already posted on the archive, but uh, not yet uh, published. So this is already from a 12 EV experiment. Um, I wanted to show them because uh, well, because they are very recent, uh, uh, very nice conclusions. So one of the things, so let, let's start maybe with the, the, the top plots here. So these are the interference term. Um, so you can see here the uh, sigma TT, uh, transverse transverse interference, uh, TL and TL prime uh, for two different kinematics beam, uh, beams. Um, and one of the interesting facts that one uh, checks kind of, uh, before comparing to, to any models is that the transverse transverse component uh, interference is much higher than the one where is the, some longitudinal uh, amplitude, which is a little bit um, the opposite of one would naively expect from what I showed at the beginning, where you would expect the longitudinal cross section to be dominated at high Q square, right? Um, as soon as there is some longitudinal amplitude, it, seems to be much smaller than when there is only transfer. So this is an, an initial indication of the transverse component that you can get from this relative sizes of the interference uh, terms. Now, if we look now at, uh, at the cross section as, uh, as a function of phi, um, you can see uh, this is not separated. So this is a constant term um, has the, sigma t plus epsilon sigma l. So you cannot tell which one is bigger by looking at that term. Um, the, the argument is mostly coming from the uh, interference term. And the bottom panel, you can see the uh, sigma t l prime that it's also uh, relatively small, uh, as you can see here in this plot, almost compatible with zero. Now, if you look now at, uh, at models, uh, so there is a, the comparison with one particular model that I will be describing in a minute, which as you see, uh, reproduces relatively well um, the amplitudes. So now this is not uh, strictly um, uh, GPD model that, uh, or at least not the same GPDs, the Carol even GPDs that we'll be describing up to now. Uh, because as you would say, uh, as you would expect, the models that use chiral even GPDs can only reproduce, uh, calculate uh, sigma L. And you see that sigma T will be zero in these models. And this model in particular produces a very high uh, transverse component. So this is uh, something I will come back in a minute. So let me um, go back a little bit to, to what, uh, little back to, to a, a previous experiment where this kind of puzzle of uh, large transverse component was uh, was ob first observed. So this is again, the same thing, the constant term, um, uh, sigma T plus epsilon sigma L as a function of T compared to now a, 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 a GPD model, uh, which as I said, can only calculate the longitudinal cross section, but you see that the calculation is off by at least an order of magnitude. Um, so this was very uh, puzzling. Now, before separating the different cross sections, uh, sigma t and sigma l, you, you cannot really tell, but you, you can at least look at the q square dependence of the, of the total <clears throat> and the total cross section. And it turns out to be uh, compatible with q to the minus five. So it's not, <clears throat> it's not a pure uh, 
sigma L, which would be then q to the minus six, not a pure sigma T, which will be 10 to the minus eight. And it turned out to be very similar to actually what was measured for another channel, very similar channel pi plus uh, in whole C. So this was, all this is telling us uh, before uh, we, we can, I will go in a minute to the separation of the sigma T and the sigma L, but, uh, sigma L, but this is all telling us that it looks like contrary to the predictions of QCD or the asymptotic prediction of QCD, uh, sigma T uh, seems to be uh, dominating uh, these results or this data at, uh, at the values of Q squared that we can access so far uh, at JLA, right? which again, it's uh, values of a few GeV. So the, the, the best way, of course, to, 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 to conclude is to make an LT separation. And this is um, what was done in, a, in, an, in an, an experiment that I will be describing in, in a minute. So the Rosenbluth separation, it, it consists of measuring the, the beam, uh, the, the cross section at uh, two different beam energies. So you can see here, uh, again, the, the, the expression, we changed the, uh, the, the value of, of epsilon by changing the, the beam energy. And you can see here, so we measure the cr cross section at three different values of Q squared and then constant X and for each of them, uh, two different beam energies. And you see that the epsilon value changes, but maybe 20, 30%. So the, this allows you to, to, to make a separation of these two terms. Again, cannot change it by as much as you would like, but uh, that gives you a little bit of level arm to, to separate the two terms. So here are the results as a function of phi. So you can see the cross-section for th three different values of Q square. So this is the higher, uh, sorry, the, the lower Q square, 1.5 then 1.75 and then 2 GV square at the bottom. And the open and, and closed or field and uh, open symbols are uh, for the two different values of, of epsilon. And what you, you see basically is it doesn't depend on epsilon, right? So uh, most uh, two data sets, open and uh, closed symbols are um, basically compatible with each other. You change epsilon and it means, and the result stays the same. So that is, basically telling us that sigma L is, is negligible and it's mostly sigma T. I mean, I'll show in a minute, so it's actually next slide, the, the fully separated cross-section. Um, so this is, uh, let me walk you through, through the plots. Each column is three different values of Q square. Um, at the top row, um, you have uh, the two separated cross-sections. So, Sigma T is the red points with the uncertainty bands. Sigma L is the blue data, uh, which is, as you see, compatible uh, with zero, which is this uh, line here. Um, so mostly uh, all the cross section is transverse as we can see. Um, the interference term is uh, that's, uh, it's easy to separate. Again, you only need the, the phi dependence for that. Uh, and you see uh, what, uh, what I mentioned also before that sigma, sigma TT is uh, much larger uh, than sigma uh, TL. And one thing that's uh, very interesting is that, of course, as I showed before, the GPD models uh, that calculate the longitudinal cross section fail to reproduce the. the the data by an order of magnitude, but you see here some dash lines. These are other models. These are other models that, um, as you see, reproduce the, the values of the measured cross section very well. Um, and that actually uh, parameterize the cross section, uh, the transverse cross section using uh, a different kind of GPDs, this, uh, this, this uh, transversity GPDs. No. This is what it's called the, the modified factorization approach. Carlos, um, so I said, yep. Uh, there is a question in the chat. I don't know if you can yep. open it, but uh, it can read for you. Uh, sorry for the basic question, but can you repeat where does the transfer components of the cross section come from? I understood that the factorization of the cross section work only for longitudinally uh, polarized photons. So do they come from the partners? This question is from Patricia. Thank you, Patricia. So the, the transverse refers to the polarization. So longitudinally and transfer is the polarization of the proton, uh, sorry, of the virtual photon. 
So the transverse um, cross section is the cross section that one would measure when the uh, polarized, uh, the polarization of the proton, the, sorry, of the virtual photon is transverse. And the longitudinal uh, cross section is when the, the photon is longitudinally polarized. Um, I don't know if that, uh, that answers the question. So in general, of course, uh, the photon has, uh, can have both polarizations. So, so we need to isolate uh, the one which is uh, longitudinal, the one that it's transverse, and you, we do that uh, isolation or so, that separation by by playing with the with the value of epsilon here, which is depends on the beam energy. Okay, thank you. Yes, it does answer the question. It's just that because at the beginning you say that the factorization work only for longitudinally polarized polarized photons. I assume that we are going to neglect the transverse uh, contribution, but no, you're you're saying that as a theoretical answer, but then you check all the possible contributions, right? And right. Then so you see, said, and then you see which one is uh, gives the largest contribution. It's okay. It's just that I like I assume that because of this sentence of uh, longitudinal polarized photons, then we were not going to take transverse transverse components into account. But then, but then we do. Like now it's right. clear so, that it comes from that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we measure we experimentally everything uh, is there, right? So we cannot neglect anything experimentally. Uh, uh, but the question is whether we will be able to 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 access GPDs from whatever we measure, right? So in principle, what what this means is that to access GPDs, you can only do it uh, with uh, you can only do it with the longitudinal cross section. That's in principle what QCD is telling us. Uh, you can only factorize when the, uh, the amplitude, when the photon is longitudinally polarized. So from the transverse part, you can measure the cross section, but there is no way to, to factorize the amplitude. So there is no way to put, um, to define, a, uh, basically to define a GPD um, in that way with the transverse component. Can you guys still hear me? My Zoom is making some weird, uh, yes, I can hear you. I okay, can hear so, uh, okay. Uh, so let me uh, let me back and go back to where I was. Um, so as I said, what happens is that uh, you cannot, in general, uh, when you do that, uh, your uh, you, put, you look at the transverse uh, cross section, uh, you cannot factorize it. In practice, what happens is that uh, you have infinities, right? Divergences. Uh, and uh, I mean, I'm not a theorist of factorization, which is a very complex thing, but uh, there is no way to, uh, to, to reorganize your, your amplitudes in a way that you can uh, separate this, uh, these two components into two components. So, however, uh, there is um, what we call usually modified factorization approach. So there, there is a, this is um, a model uh, to be to be more precise. It's a model uh, developed or put forward by Goloskov and Kroll, um, where they managed uh, to to regularize this transverse momentum. Uh, sorry, the transfer uh, the the infinities by using the the transverse momenta. Uh, of the of the quarks in the in the meson, so the the uh, divergences um, appear and they manage uh, to reproduce uh, to to regularize them, but by taking into compensating them uh, with the degrees of freedom, the transverse degrees of freedom of the quarks and antiquarks in the in, in the in the meson. Now the reason why this is a model uh, is because uh, not a fully uh, factorization proof is because uh, basically you, you don't do that systematically. That means that you take into account some higher order terms. So, okay, this uh, KT, uh, but they are probably other terms that are not taken into account that may create also some divergences. And so, so it's not a systematic approach of factorization, but including one particular degree of freedom, um, they managed to cancel the, or to, 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 to regularize the, 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 the amplitude. And then they managed to factorize the, the, uh, the amplitude for the transverse part. Um, and then it turns out that the, 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 
the amplitude can be uh, written as a convolution of uh, some GPDs of the neutron, but uh, of the nucleon, sorry. But they are not the ones that we, we saw before, the chiral even GPDs. They are the chiral odd GPDs, the transversity GPDs, uh, they are also called. Uh, so it's a convolution of that uh, transversity GPDs with um, a higher twist uh, pion wave function. So it's a, it's a little uh, complicated uh, uh, model, uh, so to skip it, but uh, it has the, uh, the big merit of actually factorizing this, this uh, transverse amplitude, which uh, doesn't uh, factorize uh, strictly in, in QCD. The most interesting part is actually that these calculations yield a very good result compared to data. So you can see here, so this is the, the, the amplitude um, of the, the, the unpolarized cross section, right? So sigma t plus epsilon sigma l, uh, the data on the model, and then you see, okay, it's not perfect, but it reproduces very well the order of magnitude. Uh, I mean, if, if you remember a few slides ago compared to what GPD, Chiral even GPD's model uh, can, can do this. This model reproduces very well the experimental data. And the most interesting part is that actually, well, that uh, if, if, if we believe the model and then uh, the fact that uh, it reproduces the data so well, then it, it gives an access to this transversity GPDs of the, of the nucleon, which uh, are very hard to access experimentally because uh, they don't appear in. in in DVCS or in other leading twist um, uh, processes. So the transversity GPDs, I, I will just show a little bit the same uh, diagrams I showed yesterday. So the chiral odd GPDs, so now they, they flip the helicity of, of, of the quarks compared to, to what, we, uh, what we saw yesterday. Um, so there was a question yesterday how, how this uh, formally um, um, uh, here uh, in, in the definition. So, so I included uh, here the, the, sorry, go ahead. Um, um, how the, the, the GPDs have, have appear formally from, from, the, from the quark distributions. Um, so you see on the, on, the, on the top one, the, the first two quark helicity conserved with the distributions, uh, which are uh, defining the chiral even GPDs uh, that, uh, that, that we saw yesterday. And then the quark helicity flip distribution, which goes with the uh, direct, uh, direct matrix uh, the sigma plus, and which defines the, the, the transversity GPDs uh, I just showed uh, more pictorically in the previous uh, so slide. So, so for form more formal definition, uh, of these distributions, I included here a reference. Uh, this uh, this is all uh, detail. Um, so now let me um, describe a little bit. Um, um, sorry. Uh, now, so I describe uh, data on the proton. Now you have the same thing that uh, we did with DVCS. We can do that uh, pi zero electron production of the neutron, and this will help you. Help us uh, to to separate the the different contributions as a function of the flavor, and you can see here the same technique um, as before. We have a deuterium target. We subtract the contribution from the proton, and then we are left out with uh, neutrons and deuterons, coherent deuterons, and then we have this kinematic shift uh, that uh, appears as a function of t uh, that I showed before. So it's the same principle. Uh, you see the, the, the data looks much cleaner because it's um, uh, the cross section of pi zero production is much higher than uh, the cross section of uh, DVCS. But still you see that the separation between the uh, deuteron peak uh, and the uh, neutron peak is, 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 very, is very small. So these are these are the results of uh, of the pi zero electro production, electro production cross section of the neutron, and, and you can see um, both actually uh, neutron and deuteron. The deuteron, on the other hand, is found compatible with with zero, is the magenta points and the magenta bands, and then uh, the the neutron cross section, uh, pi zero electro production cross section of the neutron is, is shown in blue. And again, you can comp uh, we compare here with the prediction of these transversity GPD models, and you see that it, they're uh, really uh, very good uh, 
uh, very good uh, reproduction of the uh, description of the of the data. So this was measured at two beam energies, as uh, it's shown here, uh, 4.4 and 5.5. And you see that the, the cross section is very similar. Uh, so it's uh, again, an indication uh, that, the, uh, that the cross section is dominated by the transverse component, but we can, in this experiment, we did have these two beam energies. So, the, so we can do a fully, a uh, full separation of the transverse and longitudinal components. So you can see here uh, the blue the blue points, the transverse cross-section uh, for the pi zero electro production, and then the longitudinal cross-section in blue, which is compatible with zero, as you can see, and then the two interference term, the TT, uh, which is uh, significantly larger than the TL, which is basically compatible with zero. So we recover, we find again, we confirm the, the previous results we, we, we saw in the pi zero production of the neutron, uh, of the proton. But now the, the advantage, of course, is that we can combine both a neutron and proton data as we did for the VCS uh, to access this uh, transversity GPDs as a function of, of the flavor. This is what, what I show in the in the next uh, slide. Uh, so uh, again, we, we use uh, the uh, so-called modified factorization approach, which as I said, is a little bit of a model. It's not uh, purely a QCD prediction. And in this model, so uh, sigma t depends on uh, these two transversity GPDs. Sigma t t depends on, on this one. So basically by measuring sigma t t and sigma t, you can extract uh, h transversity and E transversity, uh, these uh, two Compton form factors that are convolution integrals of, of GPDs. And then by combining data from the proton and the neutron, one can, uh, can extract separately the contribution from the up quark and the down quark. And you can see basically here the, the results. Uh, in the top plot is uh, H. The, uh, the bottom plot is uh, E bar, and then you have the contribution from the U quark in magenta and the green and the down quark in, in, in green. And you you find again that what uh, there was a question on previous lecture, right? So so the U quark is a little bit more uh, better constrained because uh, basically uh, the data from the proton uh, is more uh, is more accurate than the data from the from the neutron. So this is uh, the first uh, part of uh, the lecture. So now I, I wanted to, to the second part to, to, to go a little bit into, into models of uh, GPD and how to model uh, these functions. Um, so as a, uh, to start with a reminder of the properties of GPDs that uh, I mentioned in the, in the first lecture uh, that of course needs to be verified by, by any model of GPDs, right? So these are conditions that one uh, needs to uh, implement uh, from the start. So the GPD should uh, verify the forward limits so part on distributions. Uh, the first moment should uh, coincide or should, should verify the, the form factors. And the hardest part, as I said that the first time is, is to implement a model that uh, verifies this uh, polyanine reality condition, right? So that uh, the GPDs, the, the, nth, uh, the end moment of a GPD must be a polynomial in Xi uh, of the order N. So this is the hardest uh, to implement uh, in a model. So uh, it is non-trivial because it, 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 it implies a, a, an in interrelated uh, dependency between X and Xi. So you cannot just implement some random uh, dependency. It needs to be uh, verified on this way. So the, the a solution to do that very elegantly, what was proposed in, in 97 by uh, Radushkin, uh, and it's basically a solution in terms of uh, double distribution ansatz. So basically you, you, you implement the function here and you uh, convolute it in this way uh, as a double integral. And by definition, um, this, uh, this distribution will verify um, uh, polyonymiality. However, uh, it was found a little bit later that it was not verified uh, everywhere in the full uh, X uh, domain. So there was a, a, 
an additional terms that had to be added. Uh, that, uh, it's called uh, the, the D term that was uh, proposed by Polyakov and Weiss a little bit later, uh, in order to respect the polynomiality within the full uh, X X domain. And then, okay, there was an, another general solution to, to combine these two into a more general uh, function here. But this is one of the approaches to, to respect this uh, polyonimality. It's not the only one, there are other ones. So I will not describe the other ones, but uh, this is the, early, the earliest approach to, to verify this condition. Now, uh, for that function, so this is, uh, this function here that you, you need to implement, uh, you still uh, need to verify the other, uh, the other forward limit conditions and so on. So, so, so the easiest way is to, to have a Parton distribution function times some kind of profile function. And then, okay, you, you, you need to verify it, of course, that it's uh, correctly normalized. And then you, it turns out that the profile function, you can read, write it as uh, so just a normalization constant and it, it will have this, uh, this form and only depends basically on one single parameter uh, B. And if you look at uh, the interpretation of that par particular parameter, basically um, it tunes uh, the correlation or uh, the dependence uh, of Xi uh, and X in the, in the model. So a larger value of a, B, for example, implies a, a softer Xi dependence of GPDs and the limit of uh, very large B or B equal infinity, then you will find that uh, it's basically Xi independent. Your model will be Xi independent. So this is a little bit the, the, uh, the physical meaning. Now, uh, so, it's a very elegant uh, way to implement uh, all, uh, to fulfill all the requirements. Um, the disadvantage of course, is that you have only basically one free parameter in your model. Uh, and that makes it also very challenging then to later to, to reproduce uh, experimental data, right? If you only have uh, one parameter to, to, to tune. Uh, so this, this only deals with the most complicated part, which is the X and, and Xi dependence. Then you need to implement your T dependence. Uh, you remember GPDs have three variables. Uh, the easiest way, of course, is to just, uh, you don't have any strong conditions about the T dependence other than the, the fact that you need to, of course, verify the, the first moment to be equal to the uh, form factors. So you can simply, uh, for example, just uh, factorize it and you say, okay, my, my GPD is going to be the, the double distribution function. I just calculated uh, in this way uh, times a form factor. And okay, that, that's simple. Uh, that doesn't work very well with the data. Right? It's simple. Um, so there are more, and then this, this D dependence, there, there are many different ways. I mean, to do it more or less sophisticated, uh, they're usually inspired in some, uh, in some physical models behind uh, like uh, rigid theory or um, uh, quark uh, dual model, uh, die quark models. Uh, for example, this one, which works particularly well is uh, you parameterize the T dependence a little bit correlated with the, with the variable X. And you can actually, uh, you have a free parameter, an addition of free parameter alpha prime that you can fit to the data. And that can be in interpreted as a, as a rigid, rigid trajectory, for example. So, so what you do next, of course, is to compare to the to the data. So, the, so here I see some uh, some uh, shows some data that I showed before, but now the, the curves instead of fits uh, are predictions or, well, or or calculations from 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 these models. Um, uh, so you can see several of them. So. Uh, and, Okay, I will not go into the details. They are both, uh, they are all of them. So there are three, three basic models, uh, VGG in red, uh, two versions of uh, one model, one with uh, target mass corrections and the other one without. And then again, target mass corrections and without from different authors. They are all, uh, all three are based on this double distribution approach uh, that uh, I described at the beginning with different assumptions, for example, for the, for the T dependence and, uh, and the, uh, the free parameters in each of the models. So you see that uh, the, 
they all do a reasonable uh, good job, but of course the, the exact azimuthal dependence is, is difficult to describe by any single model. And, uh, the main reason is also that uh, they are not flexible enough. You know, there's a few free parameters, but they are not flexible enough to 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 accommodate all the um, all the data. I mean, and, and this is only one particular beam. Now, if you want to combine it and uh, and fit all the available data in different experiments, different kinematic ranges, it becomes much more complex. So, one uh, complementary approach. Oops. Uh, um, is of course instead of uh, trying to to do that from first principles from models is to to do fit. Uh, to you just come up with a functional form and then with more free parameters than you usually have if you start with a dynamical model and uh, and you try to 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 see how how well you can fit the different sets of data. Uh, there are different approaches to, to, to that particular uh, way of doing things. You, you can do look, local fits, uh, which in basically you take each kinematic, uh, kinematic being independently, and then you just basically fit all the quantum form factors. So there, there are typically eight if you have four GPDs and you have real and imaginary parts of them. So that, that, that makes uh, four uh, free parameters to fit. To, to some kind some kind of limited uh, data set because it's only one beam. Uh, so it turns out to be, uh, you know, the, the results you get uh, are highly correlated, so big error bars, but you know, it has the advantage of being kind of model independent in a way. Uh, you can try to do what's called global fits. And this is basically you, uh, you take a functional form and you, you try to, to fit different kinematic beings in different experiments at the same time. Uh, so this is done by a, a other set of uh, theorists. Uh, and then there are some different methods of combined hybrid uh, and local fits. And basically you can, you can try doing both things, for example, and that gives you a, a kind of an estimate of your systematic errors, right? So you can do some kind of global fit and then do a local fit and see how much they differ from each other. And that gives you a little bit um, a, a feeling of how, how, uh, how large are your uncertainties or systematic uncertainties due to the, to the fit procedure. And then finally, more recently, I mean, an approach that is more, uh, I mean, much more flexible, of course, is to, to use uh, machine learning or uh, neural ne networks, uh, which has already been used, for example, for PDFs, but PDFs are much uh, simpler functions. They only depend on one variable. Now, uh, for GPDs, where you have three, three variables, uh, it's a much more complex uh, task, but uh, it's something that has been started already, and it's, it's giving some reasonable good uh, results, uh, I will show a little bit in a minute. So let me start with, um, sorry, the, the lines are not very visible in the plot, but I will be mostly uh, discussing the points. Um, so these are uh, the first uh, early tries, so you see 2008 of uh, local fits to data. So this is uh, some data from Hole class on, on Hermes. Um, so you don't see the data, these are the results of the fit. So you just uh, look at um, the cross sections or the asymmetries depending on the experiment and you just fit all your uh, quantum form factors as free parameters. And these are the results of the, uh, of the fit parameters. So you can see that, uh, uh, of course, not you fit uh, several uh, quantum form factors. Here, you only show the ones that gives you some reasonable error bars, uh, the ones that are mostly uh, dominating the, the cross section. So in, in the case of uh, DVCS with an unpolarized target, so you're mostly sensitive to H and H tilde. So here you're showing the imaginary part of H, real part of H, and the imaginary part of H tilde. So you see that there is a reasonable uh, good agreement uh, between the different uh, data sets that are um, obtained with different uh, different fit assumptions. And then what you see, the lines that you hardly see are the predictions of, of the models. Uh, so you see that also what you extract from the data and the, the model's prediction are sometimes in good agreement, not always. But. So 
but you you already get a little bit from these uh, slopes. You know, the error bars are still uh, large, but you, you get that the, the, the t slope that relates to the size of the the object. Uh, you, you see that the the valence quarks are mostly concentrated uh, uh, in the large uh, in the large uh, sorry in the low x region and where the the Asian axial charge with its H is more concentrated than the, the, the electromagnetic charge H tilde, where basically the, the slope of uh, H is uh, larger than the slope of uh, H tilde. That's uh, some physical uh, interpretation or physical conclusion that you can get from those plots. Now, if we go to global fit, so this is um, uh, work by Kumariki, a little bit more recent. Uh, so you try to fit all the data simultaneously. Um, you have a little bit more uh, free parameters than in a truly uh, dynamical model. So you just take a functional form and, uh, and parameterize a little bit the shape by, by a few free, par free parameters. And you see that the, the, the description of the data is relatively well, not uh, relatively good, not always, you see. So here one would expect a little bit of higher, uh, maybe higher order contributions. This is of course, as I said at the beginning, all the models so far are leading to east uh, leading order. So maybe that's also something that explains the small differences, but it's a very uh, reasonable good agreement overall between the, the data and the fits. And then and neural networks, of course, uh, this is, uh, as you all know, uh, a little bit of a black box, but very flexible uh, way of uh, performing these kinds of fits. Because uh, you know you, you can fit a very complicated uh, function. You don't need to parameterize it uh, by any particular uh, form. So there is no theoretical bias in the, in the shape of the result that you will get. Uh, so you enter uh, basically your uh, your kinematics, uh, your data points, and then uh, the network uh, will output you, your uh, uh, your quantum form factors, and then you can train it. Uh, you know, you can train it on SEDU data, and then uh, do the later apply to the to the real data. So this is uh, a little bit a comparison with different methods. Um, and, and you see on one particular, okay, maybe this is the easiest or the, more, and the best constrained uh, quantum form factor, which is the imaginary part of H, but you can see here different methods. Uh, so, so then you can see here the different papers. So basically um, uh, the blue squares are our local fits. Um, the green uh, diamonds are uh, are also uh, are um, I believe they're they uh, global fits. There you go. And then and these uh, red circles are the mixed uh, hybrid uh, fits where you do some global fit, but then uh, estimate the uncertainty by performing some uh, some local fits. So you see there is a certain uh, uh, good agreement between the different different methods. So this is um, my last slide before the conclusion. So th this is, uh, again, once you do this extraction, the, the ultimate goal, as I said at the beginning and the first lecture is to, to make this 3D imaging of, of, the, of the proton or the, the nucleon in general. And, and this is now an actual 3D image that is uh, coming from data. So this obviously, it uses a model of, uh, or a parametrization of, uh, of this uh, quantum form factor. So it was done by um, fitting the DVCS data by uh, some uh, quantum form factors uh, functional form, and then uh, Fourier transformed that uh, distribution to, to reconstruct uh, the, the 3D image. And so you can see the transverse plane in these uh, two dimensions. And then the, uh, this uh, dimension here, x, uh, shows the momentum fraction. So again, what you see is that the, uh, the high uh, momentum fraction partons, so the, the, the higher energy partons, are concentrated in, in, a, in a very small region around the center of the proton or the neutron. And then the C quarks and the low, uh, low momentum fraction quarks uh, are in the outer, in the outer part of of the, of the proton. 
So this is, of course, uh, very, uh, really the beginning of this imaging, right? So there's uh, still uh, a small amount of data, but th there is much more data to come to with the uh, first GV upgrade uh, using both neutrons, polarized protons, positrons, as I said. So there is a, a lot of more data that it's coming, and I will be uh, describing a little bit uh, those experiments uh, tomorrow. So let me uh, conclude then by summarizing so this uh, so this lecture so uh, we've uh, seen in the first part uh, that deeply virtual meson production provides a complementary way to access uh, GPDs of the nucleon uh, at moderate values of Q square uh, as I said several uh, few GEVs the D DVMP cross section seems to be dominated by the transverse amplitude which is uh, not the asymptotic prediction of the QCD. However, uh, this uh, might turn out to be very interesting because uh, within this uh, modified factorization approach, one can access uh, transversity GPDs of the nucleon using pi zero electro production. So this is uh, interesting because otherwise these transversity GPDs, they do not enter in, in the handbag diagram of GPDs or uh, of DVCS or other, or other processes. So this is really the, the only access um, to this uh, these functions and then the second part uh, just describes some some techniques to model gpds which uh, as, as i said is challenging but uh, great progress has been made uh, recently with different approaches and even the first 3d images uh, of the internal structure of the nucleon start to, to come out uh, based on not in pure models but also uh, from experimental data now Okay, thank you very much. If there are questions, I hope so. Uh, be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Carlos, for a very interesting uh, lecture. Uh, let me go to the participants. And we actually have to, to raise hands. Uh, the first uh, raise hand is by Patricia. Go, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you again for the very nice lecture. It was very, very clear. Um, and my question, it's something that uh, maybe, I mean, probably you already have explained, but I would like to ask anyway, so I, so I get it. Because um, you, when you saw, like, when you showed the theoretical calcula calculation of the cross-section in longitudinal and transverse components, you say that for very high uh, Q square, uh, the meson production is dominated by longitudinal processes. But then, when you when you show the experimental results, as you said in your conclusions, that you say that at moderate values of Q square, uh, the transverse uh, component of the cross section is the one that is dominant. So I, I was wondering if you have any explanation for for why this occurs. Like, is it something? Like maybe the theoretical calculation was done only for leading or the contributions, or maybe um, uh, the theoretical calculation should need a different approach. Like, like why does this this happen? Like, I didn't get why why it happens. Yeah, no, the the the, the only reason is simple: is uh, that the calculation is done at q square equal infinity. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> so the, okay. this is only true at very high values of q square. Okay. So. Uh, at what values of Q square uh, that's true, then you need to do you need to do experimentally. So, so for example, for DVCS, uh, the calculations that were done at uh, Q square equal infinity seem to be in good agreement with the data, right? So the, the right. handback is dominating very well DVCS cross section. For DVMP, it doesn't seem to be so. So the, you would need to go to much higher values of Q square. Um, to, to factorize or to, to, to actually have this uh, asymptotic limit. So this is the, the asymptotic limit at Q, Q square equal infinity. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Patricia. Now we have a raise hand by uh, Victor Martinez Fernandez. Go ahead, Victor, please. Thank you. Uh, what I wanted to ask is uh, that you you said that in this uh, meson production factorization is only uh, a property, a good property when the photon is uh, longitudinally polarized. Nevertheless, when you were uh, working a little bit out the, the, the transverse cross sections, you introduced these uh, so-called transversity GPDs. My question is how can you define 
such uh, GPD objects or GPD-like objects if you don't have factorization? Well, that's a good question. Uh, you, you, you need to have factorization, as you say. So, so basically, uh, you factorize it, uh, but it's not a model independent factorization, so to speak. So, so as I, I was trying to explain here, so you have infinities that in, when you look at the transfers uh, component and to regularize that infinities, you use uh, some additional degrees of freedom. Uh, so you take into account the, the, uh, the transverse momentum of, of, meson, of quarks and antiquarks in the meson. So that allows you to regularize your uh, singularities. Now, the details uh, are technical and I won't be able to explain them to you, but you manage to have finite integrals and then you factorize. So, so in this model, you, you do factorize. Otherwise, you cannot, as you say, as if you don't factorize, you cannot define the quantities. Okay, and do you have, uh, this archive reference is uh, the one for, for going deeper into this? Uh, that no, that would be for the data. So the, you would need to. I can maybe uh, I can post it later on the. Uh, so this is the reference for for the model. But I I can give you the archive um, maybe later by chat or on the on Slack. I can put that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Victor. And now we have a raised hand by Christopher McClure. Lin, sorry if I no, mentioned. Actually, no, no, actually, I don't know what. <laughs> actually, this is an archive of. No, okay, I, I think this archive is for the data. So I, I'll put the, the, the one from the model uh, somewhere on Slack or. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I don't know if I missed it in your talk, but uh, at the end you talked about how high zero electric production can allow for the probing of the transverse to GPDs and how that's was sort of the only avenue we had for that. Is there a reason why we can't use, say, high plus electroproduction to do that? Is it a matter of oh, it's it, it, uh, No, sorry, sorry. Yes, maybe I, I didn't say. It's not the only. If pi plus is, is, is also, uh, it's also possible, of course. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I, I didn't mean the, the only, but the, I was referring compared to DVCS to where they don't appear, but you're right. It's not the only. Okay. okay, thank you, Christopher. Do we have more questions, comments? I don't see more recent hands. Uh, sorry, we have we have two reasons here. Uh, the first one is by Caleb Fogler. Go ahead, Caleb. Uh, just a quick question. Um, on slide seven, is it the second plot also supposed to be t min minus t? Oh, sorry. I think it's um, it's a little bit cut. So this should be um, the same thing. T okay. minimum minus T. Uh, so T minimum is the minimum value of T, which is when the virtual photon is parallel to uh, to to the proton or to yeah to the to the target. Um, yeah, sorry, that, that was the the yeah, sorry. It's just the the figure is capped. So it's T minimum minus T. Thank you. Now we have uh, uh, Matteo Ceruti. Please go ahead, Matteo. Thank you for your nice uh, lectures. And uh, uh, I want to ask you if you can give us some uh, comments about the best approach to fit data. W what, what do you think about these? Uh, you think that it's better to have uh, global feeds to perform global feeds or uh, local feeds or an hybrid approach or the, the neural network uh, approach? Okay, so that's, that's an interesting question. So, um, 
I mean, it depends. Uh, well, local local fits think uh, it's good as a starting point, but of course, it doesn't tell you much, right? If um, I mean, it's very hard uh, to fit so many parameters to one particular. Uh, so let me see. For example, I don't know what I would. Um, so let's say a, a, a local fit. You will need to fit eight uh, quantum form factors to to this data. And you don't have so many degrees of freedom here. So basically, the phi dependence will give you two or three independent terms, but you, you have too many parameters. So, so the, the uncertainties are very large because of the correlations due to that. So, so ideally, you want if you want to do fits, uh, ultimately, you want uh, to do global fits because you want to not only fit your data, uh, but the goal of doing fits is to be able to extrapolate to where there is no data. Um, because where there is data, you already know the result, so you don't need the fit. If you want the fit, is to extrapolate to, to a region where there is no data yet. So, so you need a uh, global fit. Now, whether these uh, fits can be done uh, with a function or neural network, um, I think uh, um, neural networks are a little bit more flexible. Uh, so as I was saying, they don't have a bias. Uh, so if you do a, a global fit uh, with a functional form, okay, you're constrained by the form, right? So you only have a limited number of fit parameters. Uh, neural network will provide you so, uh, a random shape. It's not constrained by the functional form. So they are more flexible. They are a little bit less controlled, I would say. So it's hard to, to, to harder a little bit to, to estimate the, the uncertainties, the systematic uncertainties of the fit, I would say. Um, but uh, it's a much more flexible um, flexible way. Um, now, this is for fits. Uh, so the, the approach of fits is, okay, you will get a functional form that would allow you to maybe, if it works well, to make predictions on regions where there are no data. However, it doesn't tell you a lot about the dynamics, right? It doesn't teach you a lot about uh, the structure or QCD or, you know, so, so using a functional form, which is inspired in some kind of model will tell you a little bit about how well your model uh, reproduces uh, what's happening inside the, the, the proton, right? So that's also something to consider, right? That you, you can have a very good fit. I think we lost the lecturer. Yes, I think that we lost him, but. Uh, while we're waiting, just a quick question. Those who still have raised hands and had already asked questions. Uh, right now, it's, I think only Victor, do you still have a follow-up question or? No, okay. <laughs> ah, you're back, very nice. <laughs> yeah, sorry. For a moment. <laughs> sorry, I was disconnected. Um, was it just me or? I guess so. Can you, you can you hear me again? I can yes. hear you. Yeah, we can. You went out for a minute. Okay, so I don't know what uh, when did you lost me, but um, so I, maybe let me recap a little bit the the last part of my answer. Uh, so I, I I was saying that um, uh, neural networks are pro probably the most uh, flexible way to 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 make a parameterization, a fit, a global fit. Uh, but however, they don't tell you a lot about the, the, the dynamics or uh, what's happening inside the proton, right? So, so it will not tell you, teach you a lot of physics about, uh, so it will allow you to make predictions of uh, how the cross sections and the quantum form factors will look in, in, a, in, a, in a place where there are no data uh, available. Um, but if you use a functional form uh, that is inspired in some kind of uh, dynamical model, that will uh, tell you how good your model is. So it will teach you about the, the, uh, the dynamics of the system. So it's a little bit uh, complementary approaches, I would say. Okay, it's clear. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Mateo. Uh, thank you, Carlos. I don't see any more raised hands. Are there any last question before I make a few announcements?
does it look like? Uh, I read that some of you would like the archive reference that you were talking about. So maybe we can share that in the in the Slack channel because it would be convenient so everybody can can get it. Maybe that's a that's the best way to do it. Yeah, so I will do that, but I will also upload the, so I will put them as links in my presentation and I will upload the, the new version uh, later tonight. Uh, but yeah, I will do both. I will put them on the, on the Slack and the, on the as hyperlinks in the, in, the, in the presentation. Well, uh, thank you, Carlos. Uh, two more reminders. Uh, well, we, we come back in at, at 1.30, I think. Yes, at 1.30. I, uh, we would advise you to try to stay at least five minutes before so we can all connect and be there on time. And uh, secondly, uh, we have also a recap session with Yang Wei this afternoon at 4.30, so uh, be tuned on that if you want to, to join. Other than that, uh, thank you very much and uh, enjoy your lunch dinner. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night, Carlos, for you. Bye-bye.
Hi Graham, this is Albert Bacardi. Are you there? Is everything set up? Can you share? I'm here, <clears throat> just turning the camera on. Um, okay. Very good. Oh, I see you. Yes, let's see if we can do some sharing. Oh, look, you want to uh, security preferences. Good thing we try this out in advance. Because I seem to remember that when you when you do this, it kicks you, throws you out of the Zoom again. Okay. Now it's going to quit and reopen. Okay, I'm back. I'm going to try sharing the screen again. Desktop one. There we go. Okay, hopefully you can Hopefully you can see the slides. Yes, we can. Okay, you're almost there. Yeah, we'll be starting in two minutes. In the meantime, for the HUG students, a uh, couple of reminders. We will have, the, the, there is a deadline for, for submission of your, your um, abstracts for either the presentation or the poster tonight. So please do that. You are uh, okay, contractually obliged to give a presentation in principle. That was in your, in, in, your, in your invitation letter, but consider it seriously. It's a big, big possibility that you have to not only showcase the, your research to all of us, but also uh, to present. And there is nothing like presenting to learn how to present. And this will be a big part of your life as, as physicist. The other thing is that at 4.30, but on Blue Jeans, we will have a recap session with Jan Wei Chu about uh, Intro to QCD, about QCD. So uh, the, 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 this recap is optional. You are very welcome if you're interested, if you have other useful um, ways of using your time, you're also welcome to do that. But uh, Jan Wei will be there for an open-ended chat and discussion and maybe some calculation. I don't know. We will start and we will see where it goes but it will be uh, an opportunity to, to have this open-ended discussion with him and among us. Can you repeat the hour, please, of this recap? 4.30 p.m. Eastern US time. In Zoom or Gather or? It will be JLab. JLab. Yeah. Have a look at the Indico anyway. Uh, the Indico is, is the most updated uh, schedule we have. 
Okay, thank you. But for 30 p.m., please come, all interest people. And I think we can also start. So welcome back to eHugs 2021. I am very happy to introduce you to uh, Graham Hayes, who uh, will continue our series on computing trends in nuclear physics on data acquisition topics and, and much more. Uh, Graham was uh, born in the UK, got a PhD at the Liverpool University in 1985, and then going into CERN, joined JLab in 1991 in uh, uh, the data acquisition group, indeed. And uh, most recently, in 2020, he became head of the uh, scientific computing group, but retained uh, an interest in, in data acquisition topics, as he will now than you all. Please go ahead. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk about data acquisition, streaming, calibration and triggering, um, which is lumped together in, in what people call the online world as opposed to everything that happens after the data has been taken, so the offline world. So we'll start off talking about data acquisition. So this is the process of collecting and organizing information. Um, I heard a story long ago when I, when I was an undergraduate that 100 years ago, research into radioactivity, they actually had people in darkened rooms with magnifying glasses, actually counting the number of flashes of light as, as a nuclei decayed. And the experimental control rooms are still called the counting house to this day after these people sitting in the dark counting things. Because nowadays we do everything um, electronically and we have electronic sensors of various varieties, a data acquisition device that digitizes data from the center, uh, <coughs> the center and a computer that, that uh, does the analysis and storage. There's a picture of John Alice at CERN sitting in front of some of the data acquisition hardware for one of the LHC experiments. Uh, in nuclear physics, there are two distinct types of data acquisition. There's fast data acquisition, which is taking data from the experiment that actually is gonna be used to generate physics results and slow controls, which is the low rate monitoring of condition that they detect. And this, this talk is gonna focus specifically on fast data acquisition. So obviously at, at JLab, what we're doing is investigating how quarks and gluons make up the proton, that make up protons and neutrons behave when they are parts of a nucleus. And uh, that's distinct from HEP labs like CERN, where there's more of a focus on the fundamental particles of which the quarks and gluons are examples. Um, this has an implication for uh, data acquisition in that typically the, the HEP labs are looking for very rare events, which are very large uh, and, and the amount of data involved. Where in nuclear physics, we're doing statistics on, on a large number of, of relatively small uh, pieces of data. So nuclear physics at JLab, the CBF accelerator generates a beam of electrons. All the experiments are fixed targets the energy of the electrons is high enough that the wavelengths are short enough to resolve the details of the nucleus at the quark gluon level. So it seems rather simple. You fire the uh, electrons at the target, you measure the energy, momentum, and type of particles in, um, produced, and you statistically analyze, analyze the interaction. Of course, in real life, it's seldom so simple. Um, in fixed target experiment, the particles from the interaction mostly travel forwards in the beam direction. So detected designs such as class 12 here at the bottom take advantage of this by putting much of most of the detected hardware in the direction you expect the, the, uh, the particles to move in. The large experiments contain many different types of subdetectors. So you've got silicon vertex detector, time of flight, and so on. And these mostly in fixed target experiments are in the form of planes downstream, and then close to the uh, the target, you, you might get some. Um, detected with a larger solid angle. Um, colliders are different in character because the particles are coming in from either side. And if they're matched in momentum, then um, you can get um, products from the interaction moving in just about any detector. So you try to have as much solid angle as you can. Making uh, spherical detectors is pretty hard. So most often you'll see cylinders with planes at the end with the end caps. 
uh, to capture uh, all of the products from the interaction. And there's a, a, a picture of a, a, a typical event in, in uh, Atlas at LHC. So talk a little bit about um, detectors. Well, this is a very simple one. This is a scintillator. Uh, particle passes through the scintillator, deposits some energy in the form of a photon that's picked up by a photomultiplier. This generates a, 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 a charge pulse, moves along the wire. In this case, you charge up a capacitor, which effectively measures the area underneath the pulse, which is proportional to the amount of energy that was deposited. And then you measure the voltage across the capacitor with an analog to digital converter. So you've taken an energy deposited and converted it to a digital value. Other things that we measure um, uh, in detectors, apart from charges and voltages, are times. So when did this happen? And counts, or how often did it uh, occur? So the two ways of um, measuring this pulse that's coming out of your detector, a traditional integrating ADC, which was um, the example on the previous uh, slide, takes about six to 10 microseconds to digitize a pulse because you, the pulse comes in at one end, you store it up in your capacitor until you've integrated the area. And then <clears throat> once this, this uh, gate signal closes, you read out the value off the ADC. A flash ADC is an alternative where you clock the ADC at some fixed rate. In the case of JLab, it's 250 megahertz, so one clock tick every four nanoseconds. So you measure the voltage on every single clock tick. Um, we cut down the amount of gate data that we, that we acquire by having these gate pulses, which define a region of interest. So you don't uh, keep measuring for the eight outside the, the, the region of interest. You only measure the piece in the middle. So how do we put this together in a system? Well, in a typical experiment, you've got um, thousands of detector cha uh, channels. So we need thousands of ADCs or TDCs as well as other electronics to digitize all of this. The current standard is that you build your ADCs and TDCs on a board. You plug multiple boards into a chassis, which, they, which uh, colloquially is known as a crate. The, uh, the crate has a back plane on the back of it, which allows you to connect all of the boards together and to a CPU, which usually is in the left-hand slot here. Uh, and the CPU reads out the data from all other boards. So in the case of JLab, we have ADC boards with 16 ADCs. We can put 16 on the crate, so that's 256 channels. So to read out uh, tens of thousands of channels, we need 50 to 100 crates of electronics. So looking at that, data requisition systems are actually pretty big things physically. And here's a couple of, uh, of slides. Here again is the class 12 detector as a schematic and here's the thing in real life, there's the torus, here are planes of detectors, here's the central tracker. And then this blue thing on the left is the, uh, a steel framework that's holding up all the racks of electronics for the, the data acquisition and the control and the monitoring of the detector. And there's some more racks over on the other blue frame at the back here. Similarly for GLUEX, schematic of the detector, um, the green thing is the solenoid, there's, there's the green thing on here. You can see the cabling coming out of the end of the detectors. And then all of these black racks here uh, hold the electronics for the data acquisition system. Now, there's a reason for showing this, which is that it's not as simple as having one computer that reads out the data from an experiment. The data actually appears spread physically over all of these different systems and has to be brought together. And I'll say some more about that later. So triggers. So we know we want to study how particles interact with a fixed target or another beam. We know that the various types of particles are arranged in a 3D volume, and we know how to build a digitized flight tech. The electronics digitize it. We move the digitized value to a computer, so we're done. Not really. First thing we don't know is how much of this data coincides with particle interactions and how much of it's electronic noise uh, and other signals. We also, if you do the math, if you run a 250 megahertz ADC that generates four bytes every four nanoseconds, that's a gigabyte per second for every channel. So a 30,000 channel uh, detector will generate 30 terabytes per second of data if you just leave everything free running. And that's impossible to take. 
So you narrow it down a little bit and that's what triggers are for. So here's a simple trigger. We rely on the fact that we have more than one detector. So in this um, simple diagram, what we do is we take the pulse that comes from one detector and we split it. Half goes to the ADC, we take the other pulse and we shape it to form a digital pulse, which has a width in time, which is equal to the time it takes for a particle get it to get from here to here. We do the same for the other pulse. If we have an overlap, which we look at with, uh, with the logic, then there's a fairly good chance that these two hits and the two different detectors come from a particle that's going through. If they're outside this time window, it's impossible because um, one hit, the particle would be down here and, and you'd have missed it or it would be too close together. So that's a very simple trigger as a coincidence trigger. That sort of analog uh, trigger is very simple, but it's not great. One of the reasons is that it takes time for that logic to decide if a signal should be digitized. So when you do the split, you actually have to slow down the analog signal so that it arrives at the ADC at the same time that the trigger comes in and tells the ADC to take the measurement. So this limits the trigger rate. You can never take data with a system like this any faster than the amount of time it takes the trigger to process whatever logic you program into it. The other thing is, if you have a fast detector going into the trigger and a slow detector, you have to delay the fast signals by a long time uh, so that the slow ones can catch up and take part in the trigger. And in reality, that gets really messy. Here's a practical problem. This is, I think it's in hall C. This is the detector hub with the detector inside the, uh, the trigger electronics is somewhere down here, but these spools here are the cables that were used to delay the analog signals until they made it down to, um, uh, down to the trigger. The other thing is if you wired up triggers with discrete logic, which we used to do, you had to match up all the cable lengths so you couldn't be tidy with your cables. The cables had to be a specific length because that's how many nanoseconds per foot it took to get the signal from A to B. So this is solution, and that is an old digital pipeline trigger. So digital electronics lets us replace the cable with memory. So what you do is the flash ADC digitizes the signal coming from the detector, and it gets dropped in the memory. The next clock tick goes here, the next clock tick goes here, and so on down the line. Meanwhile, the data for the triggers moving through and for example, if the trigger logic takes 28 nanoseconds and there's a tick every four nanoseconds, then you know that this trigger belongs to the data that's seven units of memory in, in this direction. So now you only read out the memories that are flagged as having, uh, having valid data in. So that's one way of, of getting rid of the, table, uh, the, the cables. The big plus of this, of course, is that the ADC is all, always live. It doesn't have to wait for the trigger logic. So while you're processing trigger one, the data can come in for trigger two and trigger three and trigger four and everything moves as, as, as down a pipeline, which is where the name comes from, obviously. Okay, so we've got individual signals from individual detectors and we start to put it all together. And because the basic unit of data in nuclear physics is the event. And from the data acquisition point of view, there are some important characteristics of events. Unlike, for example, a movie where the data in one frame of the movie is pretty close to the one before it. So you can do data compression techniques and so on. Data from one event has no history. It doesn't depend on the events that went before and it doesn't influence any of the later events. One bad thing about uh, uh, nuclear physics data is the triggers occur with random timing. They depend on when the particle hits the target and when the interaction occurs. So you might get two triggers that are close together and the hardware is not ready for new data. You might get triggers that are, are, are far enough apart that the hardware can digitize it, but the events overlap in time. So the data from the slow detectors um, is, is that there's more than one event's worth of data in the pipe. And the other thing is that the peak event rates can be much more than the average. So you don't build a data acquisition system 
that can work at 100 megabytes per second, if that's what you think your average rate is, you build it to be a little bit faster to accommodate events that come closer together. And then the last thing is event size. And, a, and a, a trap that a lot of data acquisition system designers fall into is they forget about the distribution of event sizes. So you build a detector and build a DAC system for events of a particular size, and then you get something like this class 12 monster event where just about every single channel and every single detector lit up. Um, so you've got to be able to take, take um, account of that. So one of the ways you do this is a global trigger system. So even though the crate level trigger indicates events stored in the pipeline, it may not be something that's useful for the science being studied. So normally we use a trigger algorithm that involves several detectors. So in this example, here's our pipeline of the data going through for the, the flash ADC board. We take the sample data, we, we do a, a trigger processing at the crate level, which indicates that we, we have some reason to believe that this data shouldn't be thrown away. We then send that decision from every single crate in the system to a global trigger processor that runs some algorithm that determines whether all of the data from all of the detectors indicates that there's a good event in there. And if there is, the signal comes back around here to the CPU that's sitting on the VME bus and you read the memories out. But here's what it looks like in real life. This is an ADC crate. We have all of the boards here with the ADCs and the 16 cables per ADC coming in. At the left-hand end, we have this CPU running Linux with its network cable coming out the front. And then in the middle, we have this uh, crate trigger processor board that's uh, receiving data along the back flank from these guys. And this is what the global trigger crate lo looks like. Each one of these boards would have eight cables going to eight different um, crate trigger processors. So in this particular system, which I think was GlueX, you would have 64 crates plugged in. There's a blank plate over here, so you could, you could have a bigger system by just plugging more boards in on this side. And then these cables take the trigger outputs back to the um, back around the loop here to trigger the CPU to do the readout. So just an aside here, We've been doing this for 30 years. And when I first moved to the US and started working at, at CBAF, this was the trigger processor board. And it was built with discrete electronics. And you can see the board, how big it is compared with this modern version down here. I say modern, it was, it was designed in 2011. All of this electronics is now on the one chip. And most of the board is, is just there to hold the connectors up so they don't flap around in the breeze. And what you can see is these connectors at the top still exist on the new boards, so we've got backwards compatibility, but all of the modern data acquisition hardware, the trigger uh, uh, interfacing is done by fiber optic cables plugged into these fiber interfaces on the front. Okay. So now we've got crate level, we've got a trigger. How do you do a big experiment? So as I said earlier, all of the hardware that's doing the detecting is spread around in this big physical volume. So here's the Atlas detector that LHC, 7,000 tons of hardware, 46 meters long. And a lot of the electronics you can see here is actually buried inside the magnet and inside the detector. So we tag every block of data with metadata that says where in the detector it came from and which trigger it belongs to. We transport all that data out of the detector to computer systems we gather all the data from a single event together and then record it in some kind of long-term storage. And this requires <clears throat> a rich data format to pack the physics data with the metadata. The other thing to remember, and I've not got any time in this talk to go into it in any detail, is that these experiments run for months or years. So you need software and hardware stability, and you need a control system to start and stop data taking I need to be able to monitor the conditions under which the data was taken. So here's an example event format. This is the EAVIO data format that was developed at JLab for, for use in, in the, the four halls. It's a self-describing hierarchical format consisting of nested banks. Or what a bank is, is a container for data. So if you look over on the picture at the side here, here's a header, and then underneath the header is a block of data. 
Inside that is another bank. Here's the header. And here's the block of data. Um, I don't expect anybody to really understand this in great detail, but what I'm pointing out here is that here's the payload, here's the data that's read out from the ADCs. And all of this at the start is the metadata that describes the triggers and the types of data and things like timestamps and event numbers and so on. Okay, so we've got the data from the detect, we've put it in a nice format, now we've got to move it. Back in the 1980s uh, and early 90s, all of the data moving hardware was custom designed for a particular experiment. And often they used, tried to use standards like CAMAC or FASBUS, which were physics community wide standards, but not generally used, for example, in industry. The big drawback of that is there's a lack of commercial options. There were only maybe a handful of companies in the world who built these things. And there's an example on the, on the right. Here are CAMAC branch controllers. So each one of these goes out to various CAMAC crates. You concentrate the data in here, and here's a PDP-11 PDP uh, mini computer, which was used to read the data out. So that was terrible. So what do we do? Well, in the late 1980s, Ethernet network hardware was becoming cheap and it was becoming fast enough so it could compete with custom data transport methods. So here's an example of a DAX system from a paper I wrote back in uh, about 1990. You have the CAMAC branches, you concentrate the data in, in a VME chassis with the interface boards, you read it out with a, uh, an, an embedded microprocessor, and then you push the data out over an Ethernet cable. And then you use a standard PC sitting on the cable to, to, uh, to do the data formatting, and then you store it. And in, in actual fact, television drove down the price of tape storage and, and made it affordable for us. And we actually stored data on VHS tapes. It was cheap, but it was unreliable. But the pros, now you've got widely available commercial hardware. You've got standardization because you're using ethernet and you're using some type of tape standard that you can go off and buy off the shelf. The problem is it's still very slow for a large experiment. Internet came to our rescue. So between the mid 1980s and the mid 1990s, you would see here's what the trend was for increase in speed of network. This is a log of megabytes, uh, megabits per second, and this is year. And we were on this trajectory. Unfortunately, physics experiments were on this trajectory. Both were increasing exponentially, but the, the experiments were getting um, far ahead of what networking was doing. Along comes the internet and it changes the slope of this line. So now we're still on an exponential um, line, but it crossed somewhere in about 1998, 1999. And now, it makes absolutely no sense to go out and build custom hardware unless you're very close to the detector. You go out and you buy commercial Ethernet hardware instead. So all of the DAX systems at JLab are based on uh, network data acquisition. We have embedded Linux running on the controller cards at the left-hand side of the crate. We read the data out, we push it out over the, um, the blue cable the, the one gigabit network cable, we go into a switch, and then from the switch, we go into a, a, a PC or a rack mounted server, where we run it in software, an event builder that resembles all the pieces of the events coming from the different uh, crates. We have a mechanism where the users can add a monitor or filter of their own to access the data that flies past, and then a process that records the data to disk. Of course, this involves a lot of piecing work pieces uh, working together. We have this whole extra system that's called run control, which manages all these processes and starts them and stops them and monitors them. Of course, event building gets complicated when the event rate gets up and the data rate gets up. So how do we handle that? Well, in the data acquisition systems at JLab, we could actually um, do tiered event building. So in this example, we have 20, uh, crates of electronics. We group them in groups of five, and each group of five is read out by one event builder. 
the data from those five crates is merged, and then a secondary event in order merges the events from all the crates, and then we go through the rest of the system. And if this gets to be too much, if this is a bottleneck here, we can run multiple secondary event builders in parallel, but the diagram then gets a little bit hard for me to draw. And other, of course, other labs do things slightly differently, but here's a couple of pictures, this Atlas and LHCB at CERN. But what you can see are, are various similarities. Here's the trigger hardware. Here's the data acquisition chain. You've got very high rates until you start to do the filtering based on the trigger and the data rate drops down until eventually you've got something manageable which you push over a network and it goes to permanent storage and the same over here. So here's the summary of the state of the art right now. Data is split into trigger data and the data that you're going to acquire and store. Global trigger makes the decision Readout controls read out the data, you do the building, you do the data storage and so on. The problem is that all of the pipelines in these pieces of electronics have to be low, long enough to delay prompt data until the slowest data appears. And I'll talk about that later. The filtering is done by the trigger before you've acquired the data. So if there's something wrong, it's too late. If you've got, if you're introducing a bias or something like that into your experiment, you've already taken the data before you notice it. The other part, which is a real problem, is all parts of the data acquisition must work, otherwise you can't build the events. If any one of these boards fails, or any one of these crates fails, the whole thing stops. It also doesn't work well when events overlap in time, because you're re requiring a discrete trigger. You, you have to be able to identify in real time what's going on in there. But isn't this good enough for the experiments? I mean, we've been doing it for 30 years, so what's, what's the problem? Well, the problem is that new experiments are being proposed all the time, and the, new, the ones that have been proposed present challenges for this system. Firstly, there are detectors that don't play tick well together due to timing. You've got a very slow detector coupled with a very fast detector. You've got detectors that have peculiar topologies. They're segmented or split up in some way that makes forming the trigger hard. And then you've got detectors that just have extremely high event or data rates. So here's an example. This is a TDIS experiment tagged deep in the elastic scatter that's proposed at JLab. And I won't go into the physics because I, I, I'm sure there are people on the call here who will understand it much better than me. But the idea is that the electron scatters off the new, uh, a nucleon at just the point when there's this kind of virtual pion floating around. So you knock the pion out and your, neutra, your nucleon changes flavor. So in, in this case, you knock the pion out uh, when a proton has changed into a neutron. So, so you get neutrons emitted here. But if you go the other way, and this is the interesting one, if this is a proton, you interact with the pion and you get, <clears throat> sorry, a neutron, you interact with a pion and a proton comes out. Why is that? In the interesting one is that you, you can very easily uh, detect the, the protons using this thing called a radial time projection chamber. So this is a cylinder which is filled with gas. There's a high voltage between the center and the outside as the proton from the target curves through the cylinder it ionizes the gas and the ions drift to the wall. And effectively you get an image, a projection of the path of the proton on the wall of the chamber. So you read this thing out and then you go away and you match up the proton you detected with an electron that you detect with a super big bike spectrometer in Hall A. The problem is that the ions drift slowly so we can take microseconds for this thing to work Whereas this thing's working in nanoseconds. So there's a large timing mismatch. The other problem is that the, it's an electron beam that we're firing on this thing. So there's a huge background of scattered electrons that are not associated with the proton at all. So that makes the trigger very hard. And even with a small radial time projection chamber, there are multiple protons in the chamber at the same time. And then if you look at the data rate, 25,000 uh, sensors on the uh, TPC gives you four gigabytes per second total coming out of this thing. So the challenge is 
how to read all this out at four gigabytes per second and match up the correct electron with the correct proton. Here's solid, another experiment proposed for installation in Hall A. In the PV disk configuration, electrons are scattered off a fixed target at high luminosity. The electrons are detected by a gem detector, which is in 30 segments. The problem with this is each segment is a gigabyte per second, so you've got 30 gigabytes per second. The other problem is since you split it into 30 sectors, there are a very large number of hits that span two sectors. And the final part is this has a huge data rate, and yet so you've still got a Cherenkov and a forward calorimeter in here. So how do you integrate the non-gem detectors into this? Then my final example is just a high data rate experiment. This is a proposed detector for the EIC. Um, protons are coming out of the left, electrons coming out of the right. Because of the momentum difference, it's an asymmetric detector. There's more, there's more hardware on this side than there is on this side. If you count just the labels on the different types of detector, there are 25 detector packages and so a wide range of response times for all of those. The monster is this thing in the center, the silicon vertex detector. The vertex detector could be 20 to 50 million channels. So if you assume a 1% occupancy rate, you calculate 240 gigabytes per second, you have gigabytes of data coming out of this thing, which is a factor of 100 bigger than anything we're doing at Jefferson Lab at the moment. So let's ignore the elephant in the room and not talk about the rest of the EIC detector. It has a million channels. And if we assume we use the same technology we currently use, that's a thousand VME crates for the non-vertex DAQ, which is a factor of 10 bigger than we've got now, but is doable. And if you assume a 1% occupancy, that's five gigabytes per second, which again is doable with current technology. Bring the elephant back in the room. How do you read out the other detector that has 240 gigabytes per second? And that dominates the design of the DAQ. So that brings me to streaming mode. So in a triggered reader, the data is split into buffers and a trigger per event starts the reader. So here's our buffer of data. And every time we get a trigger, it moves its way down the chain. The parts of the event, uh, the, the events are transported through the DAC to the event build and assembled into events. At each stage, the flow of data is controlled by back pressure. So this guy here wants to fill his pipe with tobacco. He takes his hands off the bucket while he does it and everybody else has to wait for him. Data is organized sequentially by event. Another feature. Our pipeline mode readout increases the bandwidth because now instead of one bucket, you, multi you, you move blocks of events at the same time. But why is it done this way? You step back and you think, why are we doing triggered readout in the first place? Well, there are three assumptions. One, we assumed it was impossible to acquire all of the data from every single channel in a detector without a trigger. Remember right earlier on, I said that a flash ADC is a gigabyte per second per channel. The second one was even if it could be acquired, it would be impossible for you to store that amount of data anywhere. You just couldn't afford the hardware to do it. And even if you could store all of that data, you couldn't process it afterward. The offline system that you'd need to handle that much data would be huge. It turns out that technology advances in the last 10 years mean that none of the assumptions that go into designing DAC systems are true anymore. So you could switch to another model streaming mode. And in streaming mode, what you do is you read out data continuously from every channel. So you read that one ADC channel at the full one gigabit per second. You, but then you do validation checks at the source to reject all the noise and suppress all the empty channels because for most of the time, there's nothing going on in the detector. So all of that gigabyte per second is mostly noise and, 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 and zeros or background. Rather than tri a trigger event number, you now organize all your data by time, when it happened, when it was taken. You then let your data flow unimpeded in parallel streams down to some pool where you store the data at the end. The data flow you control at source. So you could think of current DAC systems just sitting at the bottom of the waterfall 
And if you need to slow the DAC down, you're trying to push the water uphill. In a streaming system, if you want to slow the DAC system down, you slow down the clock on the timestamps and it slows the data taking down. Data is processed as it is taken to reduce data volume. So at every stage down the stream, from the beginning to the end where you, you store the pool of data, you put some processing to reduce the amount of data until you get to the end. So why will you do that? What's the advantage? Well, the first thing, if you've got no trigger, it means you don't introduce any potential unintended bias due to the trigger. We can also run groups of experiments in parallel. One person tries another person's trigger. The system is simplified. There's no expensive custom electronics anymore. And the readout speed is independent of the detector response time. You read the slow detectors and the fast detectors continuously. And the fact that there's a, uh, there's a time lag between one and the other, you sort that out when you store the data in memory at the end. All of this requires a robust and accurate timestamp generation and distribution, but that's still a much simpler task than an online trigger. It has the advantage that if you timestamp everything, the system's robust against minor hardware or firmware glitches. If you lose one channel in the detector, you lose one stream of data, but nothing stops. All the other streams keep on flowing. The other thing is you end up with a much richer data set at the end. You've got four-dimensional or multi-dimensional things. You know where the data came from, when it happened, lots of information about it. So now you can use novel techniques like AI and machine learning to look for patterns rather than doing a lot of numerical processing. So in our examples in TDIS, it solves a high data rate. You're just doing everything in parallel streams. The electron data is its own stream, the proton is its own stream, and you work it all out later. In solid, the high data rates from submitted detectors are handled in parallel. You don't need to do real-time event building. And then all the soft sector edge effects and correlation with other detectors you handle offline in software, where it's easier to do rather than trying to do it in real time. And for the EIC, we handled the vertex detector by reading out sections of it in parallel and holding the data in memory and then using the data from the rest of the detector to define which pieces of the vertex detector data are of interest. So here's an example of a data acquisition for EIC. If you say we have 25 front-end buffer processors here connected to the detector with the front-end hardware, each running at 10 gigabytes per second, which you can do easily today with 100 gigabit per second links, you need 25 computers running in parallel. If you give each one of them a terabyte of memory, then you've got 100 seconds of buffer time here, which is plenty of time to do um, data processing on the data coming from the rest of the detector and figure out which bits of this uh, huge swatch of data that you're actually interested in keeping. So last part of the presentation on the calibration. So we've got all the data either by triggering an event building or by streaming. We've got it all in storage. We now have events, we're all done. No. What we have are events, sequential blocks of numbers that represent amplitudes and times in whatever units the digitized electrons spat out. To do physics, we need everything to be in the correct units. So this is um, the conversion between the raw data and the physical quantities is a data processing stage known as reconstruction, which is in one of the other presentations. But it's literally reconstructing the physics from the raw numbers. And to get from raw numbers to the physics, you need to calibrate the detector. So I won't go into this in, in any detail because it's a little bit of a complicated slide for so close to the end. But the idea here is you've got a linear detector of some length L. You've got a sensor A and a sensor B at either end. A particle crosses the detector and a pulse moves out in either direction. So here's the pulse that arrived at sensor A long after the other pulse arrived at sensor B because at sensor A is further away from the hit point. You take two measurements because you don't know the time when the, this interaction occurred. All you know is the arrival time. But if you subtract the two times, then the arrival time is eliminated from the equation and you can solve for X if you know 
how long, uh, what the velocity of the pulse is along the detector. You can work out what that velocity is because if you think about it, if you're right at one end, then TA is zero and TB is the length of the, of the detector divided by the velocity. So if you do a histogram of the distribution of arrival times of your pulses, it cuts off at a time which allows you to calculate VP. Once you've got VP, you plug it in here, that gives you X. Once you've got X, you plug it in here and it gives you T zero. So you measure three things at once. The area under the pulse gives you the energy, the position of the hit you get from here and the time when it hit you get from there. Many complex detectors are just arrangements of these linear components in sheets or cylinders. So here's an example of, of uh, five planes of detectors. Particle hits the target, curves through a magnetic field, the pulses move off towards the end, the pulses from this one have got less distance to go than the pulses from that one. So if you measure the velocity for one channel, surely you could work it out. No, because the problem is that the velocity of the pulse through each one of these different detectors can depend on a lot of different factors and could and is usually different for every single channel. So you have to measure the quantity that gives you the conversion from time to distance for every single channel. The other problem is, and this frequently happens, detectors are physical things installed by people. They, have, they expand and contract with heat, they move around. So the detectors might not be where you think they are. They could be shifted relative to each other. So how do you sort that mess out? Well, it turns out to be a lot easier than you would have thought. You just turn off the magnetic field so all the tracks are straight. So now you take a few million events under this condition, you can calculate the arrival times of all the pulses, you calculate the position of each hit, and then you know what the offset is because all of the hits have to originally form in a long straight line. So that's a simple um, example. There's much more to calibration than there is time for here, and it's not my speciality. But in the, in the end, we run simulations to produce a simulated data set and then compare it with what happens in the real day experiment. And you're just trying to make sure that your <clears throat> detector firstly generates data that looks right. But then you do things like look at interactions that might not be the one that you're interested in, but you measure the masses of various particles and make sure that the masses that you measured correspond to the ones that are, that are well published. Um, so here's, a, here's examples of, for example, this is <coughs> one of the time of flight paddles in this detector, and here are the offsets for, for, di for different, uh, different paddles, and you would try to correct this so everything, everything was a straight line around zero. What you get out at the end of the calibration are a set of numbers that you put in a database. So you've got a calibration database that has like calorimeter time of flight, various other detectors in here. One thing to remember is the calibration changes with time. So this, is a, a, this, this has time as one dimension in the database because you have to be able to retrieve the calibration that applied to the data that was taken at, at a particular point in time. The thing about calibration in the context of streaming readout is since there's no trigger, there's no, there's no need for special data taking under calibration trigger conditions. The, the, the raw data come from the detector already contains all the information that you would normally generate by doing a special run for calibration. So <clears throat> summary, data acquisition is constantly channeling you. That's, that's why I stayed in the field for, for the best part of 30 years. The technology changes all the time. People think of new experiments. And the other thing is the boundary between hardware and software is fluid. So 30 years ago, we started moving a lot of things out of hardware and into software. Now we're moving things from the software into firmware. Over the next uh, 10 years, I imagine we'll be moving things back out of firmware and into software again. So one of the takeaways is what you do in an experiment in five or 10 years time may not necessarily be what the hardware is that was available when you designed it today. 
the other thing is there's always R&D time to discover new algorithms and techniques, and you've got to fold that in when you're designing data acquisition. But the key principles of the DAX system that we rely on are modularity, breaking large problems down into small ones, standardization with data formats and data transfer program uh, protocols and hardware, which will allow future tech to be incorporated. If we didn't have a standard for how we transport the data, then we wouldn't be able to swap out pieces of software and hardware for newer versions without redesigning the whole system. As it is, if we want a faster event builder, uh, as long as it eats data and, and spits out data in the correct format with the correct protocol, uh, we, can, we can do upgrades. And then the final one is parallelism. And streaming reader is the ultimate example because you're trying to do as much as possible in parallel. So that's the end of the talk. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. This was an excellent talk. I enjoyed it and brought me back to my times in my third year. I'm in my bachelor <laughs> degree where I was asking myself, what is this great and calm I can what not? I'm a theorist, so that was absolutely a mystery for me, but after a few months, I got the hang of it. <laughs> I still remember it this fondly, and after that, I could go on and do theory very happily and forget about the rest, but it was a very formative experience. Well, it, it's, a, it's a strange thing. I, I got into this business. Uh, I'm not a nuclear physicist. So, um, but I, I, uh, I took the experiment that I was working on, which is a solid state physics experiment and totally automated everything. And then the head of the physics department uh, was the former head of physics at CERN. And he walked through and looked at what I was doing and said, hey, do you want to do the data acquisition for one of the experiments at CERN? I said, sure, yeah. And, and here we are. Very good. So, students, any question? Uh, remember, you can also uh, write in chat. If there is anybody uh, who is an attendee, please write your question in, in the Q&A panel. So, oh, quite, quite a lot. OK, I have to pull up the participant panel. And the first one is Daniel. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you for the talk. Um, so you spoke about for calibration, how you need to take into account that the detectors themselves get warped. But what about the electronics that are processing the data? Do you need to worry about them overheating and their processor speeds differing slightly from time to time, or is that not a problem? No, that, that, that's, that's generally not a problem. Um, the, the, the main, one of the main problems uh, that affects calibration um, is, is actually the conditions under which the experiment was, was performed. Uh, for example, a day like today where it's, where it's warm and stormy outside, the properties of the gases in the, in the different chambers are quite different from a, a, you know, a cold, dry day. So one of the projects that we have that we're working on right now is an AI system, which will take a look at the histograms of the data coming from the experiment, take a look at the weather conditions and take a look at the monitoring of the detector and try and adjust the calibration in real, uh, adjust the conditions of the experiment in real time to keep the calibration steady. Well, but, aren't, aren't the experiments like uh, temperature, like aren't they kept that a fixed temperature and humidity or? No, no. So to, if, you, if you look, if, if you ever get to visit JLab and you, you go into one of the halls, they, these are vast underground chambers. And so, you know, it, it's, it's steady at the, at the point of view that your temperature in your house might be steady, but it's not down to the you know, fractions of a degree that you would need to keep the calibration constant. And the other big okay. thing is things like air pressure. You know, the, the air pressure makes the, make the detectors balloon and move a little bit. Okay, cool, thank you. And now is the turn of Anuruddha, please. Hi. Hi, thank you for your talk. Uh, I just had a, a question uh, from one of the very first few slides. Uh, you explained the difference between the ADC and flash, ad, uh, flash ADC. Could you please uh, elaborate a little bit more on that? I okay. don't think yeah, I that's... quite Okay, let's go back to that. Am I getting there? I think I've gone too far. Oops. It is one of the very first. That's, the, that's it. Okay. So 
if you the, the regular uh, ADC, it works by integrating the charge underneath the pulse. So what you need to do is you need to turn it on, it starts integrating, and then when you think you've got to the point where there's no more useful data, you turn it off again. So that's what's happening here. You, you turn the you turn the the uh, the ADC on. It integrates whatever happens in that time interval, and so you get the area underneath the pulse. So you get one single number out. You lose what the shape of the pulse was. So you don't know that the peak of the pulse was here. All you know it was somewhere in there. With an ADC, what you do is you take spot measurements of the voltage. So now you're not integrating charge, you're measuring the voltage on the wire and you do it on every clock pulse. So now you've got a sequence of measurements. You've still got this gate. So the sequence starts here and it ends there. But now rather than one number, you've got 15 numbers. From that, you can integrate it yourself numerically and calculate the area where you've kept the shape of the curve. You, you know the rise time and the fall time and you know where the peak was. So it's a much richer piece of data. Yeah. So essentially the data rate is a uh, higher payment. Uh, but, the, but the problem is, yeah, the data rate's higher because now per pulse, you've got 15, 32 bit words instead of one. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's clear. Thank you. Yeah. Next in line is Matthew. Oh, um, thank you. It was a really interesting talk. Um, originally, I was going to ask a little bit about timing where you talked about these long cable delays and back pressure, whether the data acquisition essentially got behind the experiment. But then you talked about this idea of streaming and parallel parallelism, um, which solves a lot of problems, but presumably it introduces a set of new problems. For example, if you're instead of running down one data stream, you introduce uh, 20, 100, presumably you then have a, a load more crates and physical space to take up. And instead of having one sort of processor that deals with everything, you've then got 20 processors running simultaneously. So although it uh, reduces, it solves some problems, what kind of uh, problems does it create, this parallelism? So, so the, the, the main, it doesn't increase the number of hardware, uh, amount of hardware that you need close to the detector. Because basically what you're doing is instead of taking that, the, the I, don't, I don't know, 20 streams of data and merging them in the event builder down to one, you keep all 20 streams all the way across. So the amount of hardware at one end doesn't change. But you're right, at the other end, now instead of having cut the data down with a trigger by maybe a factor of 100, you've got 100 times more data. But that was the slide where I said, you know, there were these assumptions. One of the assumptions was, you could never store that 100 times more data because you hadn't got CPUs that were fast enough, but now we have. And then even if you could, even if you could acquire that data, you couldn't store it because you couldn't afford enough disk drives or whatever else, but now you can. I can buy a machine. I did have a slide that I took out. It's a picture of a machine you have in the lab, which has a terabyte of memory in it. It only costs $15,000. It has a terabyte of, of uh, flash memory, a terabyte of RAM, and a terabyte of, uh, of Intel's new Optane, which is somewhere between flash and RAM. So you can get a machine now that has the processing power and it has the disk and everything else. So now you can flip the whole thing on its head and say, instead of doing the hard thing, which is trying to work all this out in real time while you're taking the data, you just store everything and work it out later. Okay, and one of the things we're working on now is you, you did have the part of the question is, is well, doesn't it take more processing power? Um, there's a group at Lawrence Berkeley who have a light source and what they're working at and, and I'm starting to work with them is piping these streams of data right into a supercomputer center because they have the NERSC supercomputer center on the site. So you could imagine having an experiment where you have a modest amount of electronics and computing close to the detector, but nearby, and where nearby could be hundreds of miles, you have a supercomputer center and you pipe it all over the network because we can get 200 gigabit per second networks now. Yeah. 
Mm. Okay, thank you. Hello, you can go ahead. Okay, in uh, then Christopher, next in line. Um, yes, so first off, thank you so much for the talk. Um, but um, I wanted to clarify something. I feel it might just be a semantic thing in my head, but talking about the advantages of streaming, uh, you mentioned that you're removing any unintended bias due to the trigger being eliminated, but right. aren't we still effectively having a trigger on the back end because we're still analyzing the data and deciding under you know which um, voltage pulses from which detectors we're choosing to then take events as good. Um, so that sort of bias would still potentially be in there. Like what, what's right. the what's the bias you're removing? So in in, in, in the very big experiments, yes, you still have that problem. But in moderate sized experiments, I mean, one of the problems with, with data taking is that you, you set up your trigger, you take the data, you store it, and then you go off and you do the calibration and the processing and you find, oh, I put some bias in because my trigger was wrong. But what, you, what happens in, in practice is several times a day, you will stop data taking and do trigger studies and various other things to make sure the trigger's doing what you expect it to do. In this mode, at least for moderate sized experiments, you take all the data and it's only much later that you apply the trigger in software. And okay, so it's much more consistent. You don't have to worry about the hardware yeah. fluctuations as much. Yeah, and then on the large experiments, Again, like with the, the EIC example, I still had a hundred seconds where I hand, held onto the data mm -hmm. before I started to, to filter it. So you've got plenty of time while you're taking data to figure out that something's going wrong. So you can constantly keep tweaking things. So that's one of the big advantages. Okay, thanks. And now Trevor, if you are there, you can ask your question. Yeah, I'm here. I if you were calling my name earlier, I, I didn't hear it. That's why I didn't go. Oh, um, you, you will need to train me. Okay. Um, <laughs> so my question has kind of already been asked and answered at this point. It was about the technique of streaming for the data acquisition. Um, but maybe I could still ask just something else about it. Um, is it something that's just being discussed and planned going forward, or is there some facility, maybe not just in, in uh, accelerator or, or collider, but somewhere where it's being used in some sense? So LHCB um, are, are at least partially doing it, um, but they're, they're kind of a bit of an ex extreme case. But their problem is that they've got multiple terabytes of data that are coming off the, the, the detector because it's so large. Um, so what they, what they do is they stream all the data off and then they try to do as much the processing on the data as they can before they finally store it. So the, uh, and the, the issue with that is you've got, too much, you've got too much data to process it all in one machine. So you split it into parallel streams and then you process each little piece. And then you, you, as you go down, you start merging the streams. So it's a little bit like a hybrid between the system that has the event builder in and a pure streaming that doesn't have anything in it at all. So that's one. But the, the other, most of the experiments that are planning it are actually future experiments. For example, S Phoenix, they have a partial streaming. They have a triggered system, but they have the same problem. They have this vertex detector that generates a lot of data, and that will be read as, as uh, in streaming mode. Uh, there's an experiment called Greta. At, at FRIB, um, and they have a sphere of germanium crystals and an absolutely enormous data rate coming out of it. So what they do is they stream the data from each crystal independently, store it in, in, in memory, and then do the processing uh, before they do the final storage. So yeah, the, there are one or two real life examples, but most of them are, are experiments that are planned for the future. 
Okay, thank you. It's really, it's only just become practical in the last few years to, to be able to do it. And now, Andrew. Uh, I have a bit of a logistics question. So when you have something like the EIC that was proposed and they started planning for it years and years ago, uh, how is it that something like that can be approved before uh, you know the means of how to store the data in the first place, how to store and process the data? Does that not go into the planning or, or is it just assumed that the technology will, will be there? No, it, it went to the, into the planning. I mean, I, I, it did. I helped in the, the writing of the EIC Yellow Report and some of the other. So, so basically, the, the way these things work is somebody proposes an experiment and they come up with a computing or data acquisition requirements. And then there's a review of the requirements. And I'm usually one of the people who reviews the requirements and says, this is crazy and I'm going to be able to do this or I think you are going to be able to do it. Okay, and, and part of the part of your, your crazy part is that you know I've been studying technology trends and all of those sorts of things, so I know what, where things are going to be in five years or maybe ten years. Of course, there's always something disruptive that could come along and make everything that I say crazy. But it, there's, there's this extensive review process before you get approval. Now, one of the things for the EIC was. You, you have different possibilities for the detectors. So the one with big vertex detector might not happen if, or, or might get scaled back if that turns out to be crazy. And then you have to figure out, can you really do the physics you needed to do without it? I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And last question for now, uh, but don't feel shy. And, okay, I see a second one. Uh, so next question now is Chris. Uh, yeah, hi again. Um, I just wanted to, another one for comprehension. Um, with the streaming, you'll talk about how the, <clears throat> the events are now organized by time, as opposed to previously where there was a trigger and everything was organized by event. But since all the event taking um, or data taking, my understanding was that there was a very a known se time separation between all of that. So I assume that how all of that was matched up before with the trigger was still effectively matching things up by time, even if they weren't directly labeled with the time. Is right. that the right way of thinking about it, or is it some other method that these were then no, brought that, back that's, together? That, that's exactly the way of thinking about it. If in the trigger method, you're still lining things up by time, but your clock tick is the trigger. In in okay. streaming you're lining things up by time, but your clock tick is an absolute time. And, okay. what, that, and what that gains you is if, you, if your clock tick is a trigger, triggers occur randomly. So you've got a random tick on your clock, which yeah. makes it really hard to predict any, how anything's ever gonna work. Whereas if, you're, if, if you, you're doing streaming readout and your clock tick ticks an absolute time, an example is, I now know that it's impossible for one crate to generate more than a certain amount of data because that's the maximum amount of data that can come in one clock tick. Mm. But now I can design the rest of my system to always be able to handle the data. If you do it with a random trigger, you could get two blocks of data very close together and choke your network. Whereas this is, it's click, 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 everything pipes through. Okay, that, that makes sense. Thank you. The last one looks like Ching. Ching him, please. Uh, so, I, so I guess my question is about the cost of using the streaming uh, approach to the data acquisition, data acquisition system, because I get, uh, assume that you will need a lot more processing power uh, for processing all the data in real time for the, uh, streaming. It actually, it actually turns out to be cheaper. And the reason it turns out to be cheaper is that all of that global trigger hardware has to be custom designed for every single experiment. I mean, even if, even if you do it in a modular way, which is the way we do it at JLab, and, and it's the same electronics in every hall, 
you're still designing custom electronics that you have to get made. You can't buy it from a manufacturer. And so that can be prohibitively exp expensive. So one of the examples was the, the VXS crates that we buy. We buy those things because they have the VME bus and then in between the VME bus is a fast serial bus. So we transfer the data that we're gonna store along the VME bus, but all the trigger information goes on this fast serial bus, which is great, works beautifully. The problem is that with 16 ADCs in it, it's $100,000 per VME crate. And a lot of that is because we have to use the specialist hardware to do the trigger. If you throw the trigger away, you can buy a lot cheaper hardware in the 100 crates in the front and use that savings to buy better computers down the line. Thank you. Uh, I see no further questions, so please uh, let's thank Graham again. This was an excellent lecture and question and discussion session. Thank you all for participating. Thank you very much. Applause. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Double. Uh, before we leave, and actually we will reconvene at 2.55 for uh, some data science, we will, we will uh, change pace and we will go into data science. But before you leave, please, uh, I have a few announcements and uh, reminders. So for today, today we have a recap at 4.30 p.m. It is now on Indico, it is also in chat, it's everywhere. If you are interested in Intro QCD, a discussion about Intro QCD with John Wei, and all of us actually will be in open discussion at 4.30 p.m. on Blue Jeans. Second thing for today is that we have an abstract deadline. So please send us your abstract. We are all, we expect all of you to submit and the deadline for submission is today. So please submit your abstract and choice preference for poster or, um, or, or seminar. Please do that. Tomorrow, tomorrow, there will be the first of two resume and CV workshops in preparation for, well, as part of the physics careers big workshop that we have, and also to learn how to do a mock job application. And the mock job application is due June 11th. So June 11th for your mock job application, please submit that by that deadline and join us tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. for a resume and CV workshop. Finally, on Saturday, uh, no lectures. There will be a Hall A and a Hall B tour for you all on Blue Gene. So everything which is not main lectures is on Blue Gene, remember that. So the physical career workshop will be on Blue Jeans. The Hall A and D tours will be on Blue Jeans. The recap session will be on Blue Jeans. And other than that, See you at 2.55.
Hey, Malachi, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello. How are you doing? I'm well, I'm well, thank you. Trying to not to get wet, it's pouring, but I'm home. Where are you, Alberto? At home, at home, inside. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> why, are you, why are you worried about getting wet if you're at home? I don't know. It's so strong that I'm peering now for my house. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> There's a huge thunderstorm. <laughs> Can you share? Malachi. Yeah. Yeah, let's try sharing the... You cannot. Hmm. Uh, Scott, can you maybe, uh, no, who, no, he, uh, yeah, Malachi is a panelist, so you should be able sure. to. Yeah, uh, yeah, no, I, you should see this now, one sec, hopefully. Uh -huh. Yep, I see something it's about to share. Oh, well, let's see. Didn't seem to work. Yeah, it looks like it's trying to, but it hasn't come through yet. Same uh, here. Are you sharing it just from like PowerPoint? Yeah, just like yesterday. Do Nothing's wanna, changed. Um, <laughs> gotcha. Maybe, um, maybe let's try to. Can you unshare and then share again? Let's just see. If yeah, that that's exactly what I'm gonna do. Yeah. Yeah, everybody, it looks like we shouldn't have any, uh, it's set up so that everybody can share. There you, okay, I have the agenda the schedule I'm looking at. That's not what you're supposed to see. <laughs> <laughs> That's really frustrating. Okay, let's see, let me try again. It's weird because, um, you know, this happens with some of the other applications is that they they'll have, all right, this one, this one should work. It shows up now. Yep. That looks good. All right. Yeah. It's, it's bizarre. Sometimes um, um, some of the applications will show up when you're shared panel and sometimes they disappear on you. So they're all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Well, that one looks good now. Right. Okay, then uh, probably we can start now, since uh, I see there are most of the participants. And um, now we will have the fourth lecture of computing trends in nuclear physics. Today we will focus on uh, data science. Many of you are um, may be interested in this since uh, you have been registered as a computational physicist or a computational and, theor and theoretical physics. And for sure that science is like be becoming a huge part in physics. Uh, just a small thing, I already put the material of this, um, of this lecture on the side. There is a link directly to these, um, to these uh, PDF slides in, can, uh, in case you want to like, go slowly or faster than the lecture and follow it uh, by your own. So please, Malaki, uh, it's, uh, go ahead. Thank you very much. Well, again, thanks for having me. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, share some of the things that we're doing. Uh, and in this case, this talk, it will not be so much sharing what we're doing, but uh, primarily focus on a, a very high overview, high level overview of data science, or at least my perceived interpretation of it as it stands. So uh, that's not good. So for some reason, I'm sharing two things at once, which is not what I want. Uh, let me fix that. And now it's perfect, but it's a little bit, okay. Now there you it's... go, all right. All right, so, so again, the, the purpose of the talk, or, or at least my goal for this talk is to kind of provide everybody a bit of a high level overview of, of where we stand in data science. Um, and I just wanna kind of preface with the fact that data science, machine learning are just massive areas of research right now. 
And there's no, just no way, even with a few lectures, we could cover everything. So as opposed to trying to, to kind of over, try to cover everything, I want to really focus on, you know, more of a overarching workflow and some overarching ideas. And then in the subsequent um, talks, I will probably focus on one or two niche techniques just to kind of show you how one would go about developing some of this in, in real world uh, applications. So more of a hands-on approach. Um, I'm also, I guess I'll start by saying, uh, my goal is also to kind of provide everybody with a general sense of where to get some information, some um, so some resources. And uh, for those that are non-Python data scientists, I'm extremely sorry, because um, this will be completely Python-centric. Uh, but that, in, in, in reality, that that is the world we live in right now. Uh, data science is predominantly uh, focused on, uh, on implementations that are Python-centric. Um, so I'll also go over some, some terminologies and, and kind of explain uh, where some of the techniques fall into. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, the hope is really to get some of you uh, excited about data scientists and, and explore on your own. So let's, let's jump into this. So I think it's, it's, it's appropriate to ask the first question, which is what is data science? <clears throat> I mean, people use it all over the place. Uh, and so I'm sure you've seen this Venn diagram, but it's, it's worth going through it again, making sure we understand what we really think is data science, or at least what I'm talking about for this particular talk. Uh, so at the end of the day, it's really this intersect of computer science, mathematics, and, and subdomain experts. And the, the goal is to extract some knowledge or insight from the data. That's really the heart of the premise of, of a data science effort. And as you can see, uh, you have a very wide, diverse set of ex um, expertise. And so at its very fundamental core, it's very collaborative in nature. Um, a lot of times in my experience that uh, we work with explicit data scientists, explicit mathematicians, and, and then the domain experts. And then you have pretty well the data scientists that are somewhat of a translator, if you will, um, that kind of understand a lot of the elements, some, sometimes they're experts in maybe the computer science, but nonetheless, they, they're definitely the translators and they communicate with the individual components or they are the individual components. But again, it should be really emphasized that, but this is really a collaborative effort and, and especially when it comes to the domain experts. Um, to hear these horror stories where some domain expert says, I have a problem, here's some data, figure it out. And there's no more communication from there on in. That, that's one of those scenarios where it's doomed to fail from the beginning. Uh, and it really one of the emphasis, at least for the data science program at JLab is we're gonna really make sure that this is a partnership. Uh, and it's something that we will grow as a collective and, and with our university partners, with our laboratory partners, uh, it's really, you know, building an understanding of the strengths and weaknesses of every, everybody in the team and how to really take advantage of that, that data to extract that, that knowledge that we're looking for. So before we kind of start this path in data science, one has to have computing. So, um, and the good news for most of us is that most of data science can be done on a modern laptop. And of course, I. I, being a Mac person, I've posted up here the M1 chip, which has been uh, quite fantastic and has shown really some remarkable results in machine learning and, and data science in particular, uh, uh, how well it's performing relative to, to dedicated hardware GPUs. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's an example of you know, the computing resources that we, uh, we have at our disposal, disposal to do a lot of work before we ever need to worry about something like an HPC system or like an A100. You know, we don't, we don't necessarily need that level of computing for a lot of the work that you do in data science. So things that you can do right away is data, data pre-processing and, and visualization. And, and the keyword here is some, because there's definitely limitations in what you can visualize. And also some of the visualization algorithms when you're spanning the, the large, like the excess, the, the really large data space of like the weights from the neural networks, those require quite a bit of uh, computational uh, resources. <laughs> but most of the time, uh, visualization isn't a problem. 
Uh, again, there's a lot of techniques and machine learning isn't neural networks. It, neural networks is a subset, um, but machine learning has a lot of algorithms. And again, I will not have time to explain all of them and go through them all. I might list one or two just to give you some context. But apart from that, there's a long, long list. <clears throat> And, and in fact, a lot of those are pretty lightweight and you could run them on your laptop without problem. Uh, but when you do come into the world of deep learning, um, that's where you really start requiring uh, these bigger machines uh, for the, the, just to, to store the data itself. Um, and we're talking you know, gigs, terabytes, and sometimes uh, multiple terabytes um, into the, the petabytes. At that point, you clearly need a very large computing infrastructure and of course, if you're doing like large, very large three-dimensional imaging for uh, three-dimensional convolutional networks, again, those require substantial um, GPUs like the uh, A100s. But again, in general, you could do a lot of this on your own. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is a lot of times when you're developing, and this is maybe premature, but something to think about as you, if you start exploring data sciences is how does your workflow will work and how do you make it portable? Uh, one thing um, that, that I've done with students is that we start off with a container that captures all the data science toolkits that we want in the container. And then from that, we actually can convert it into a singularity image, which can easily fall onto the HPC systems. And so effectively, there's very little overhead for students and other people to kind of have the same software stack that is being used for the analysis. This is really important when you're trying to make sure that the results are reproducible and you're able to actually share the results um, or in, in the packages together. It saves a lot of time and in, in headaches when, when you, you get a container established within a group. So <clears throat> another couple of comments about computing is, is there are some phenomenal tools that are available nowadays that allow you to, to test some ideas, to do some prototyping. Uh, I'm sure, I, I suspect a lot of you are aware of Jupyter Notebooks, but again, I wanna make sure everybody has a link to it and knows where to go. Uh, these are phenomenal, uh, really practical uh, toolkits that allow you to essentially write your piece of code into a web interface. Uh, so again, you don't need to understand how to run a Linux box and all this complicated uh, HPC stuff. You could just simply launch it on your laptop and be able to start running uh, some analysis right off the cuff. So this has been a very, to me, it's been revolutionary in that it really makes it much more accessible for people to start thinking about how to prototype. Uh, the other thing is if, if your laptop were, yes. Uh, there is a question, uh, what are containers and singularity? Some students do not understand that. Oh, okay, so what's the question? What are containers and what are singularity? Oh, oh I apologize. Okay, so uh, container is essentially a virtual layer um, that allows you to extract, uh, create essentially your own virtual uh, operating system and all your virtual dependencies uh, within, a, quote unquote, a container. And so that runs on top of the original, the base level um, computing um, software stack. So when you have a normal computing uh, machine, you have an OS that runs your, your operating system. Uh, and so a container is essentially something that is a very light layer that runs on top of that, that enables potentially a different OS and also enables all this software infrastructure. I hope that, and Singularity is essentially uh, an adaptation of these containers. It is also a container, but it has a different permission access pattern. And the reason why that's relevant for HPC is when you're running a container on your laptop, it assumes that you have what's called root permission, which is a super user. It means you could do some pretty nasty stuff if you wanted to. And so when HPC, when you go on an HPC system, they, they really restrict your ability to do nasty things. One of the ways you can do that is by limiting your access patterns and Singularity intrinsically does that for them. And so that's why you go from a container, which is root based high level access because it's assumed to be running on your laptop or, or your own private machines to a singularity system that now allows you to run on a, a system that it maybe is not yours and they are not willing to give you this root access. Does that clarify? If not, please ask more questions. 
Yes, that, that clarified it. Thank you. Great. All right. Uh, and again, um, at any point, if I don't clarify it to your level of satisfaction, send me an email. We'll get on online. I could actually show you an example. I'm happy to help. This is my my role here is to facilitate and let me know what you guys need. Um, so this isn't clear. Ping me on the side. You have my email address uh, at the end of the, the slide deck. All right. So now let's go back to the next step. So Jupyter Notebooks, again, are this web interface that allows you to do some programming. And, and you could do also this markup, markup um, writing. So you could write like uh, a section that is like almost like you're writing real text. And you could say, I'm doing this for this reason. And you could explain the whole reason for why you're writing this next piece of code. And then you could write your code into these uh, little sections, these units. Uh, so again, very practical. And if for any reasons you're, you're having a bit of problems with your Jupyter Notebooks on your laptop, Google has made available what's called Collab uh, Research, uh, a, a mechanism for you to actually submit some of your notebooks onto their, soft, their, their hardware. Uh, uh, most of it's free. Of course, if you start becoming a, a, a mega user, then of course, then they're gonna start charging you. So there's different ways, but lar largely this is, um, we have, I've had students that have done this and they're able to do quite, I'm actually kind of shocked how much they're allowed to do with that free resource. So um, something to look in for when you're not necessarily able to do the things you want to do on your laptop, you can look there. Now, of course, at some point, Google will say, you need to give me money. And then you might say, I, I don't want to, I don't have money. <laughs> Uh, so then you can look at your reg regional HPC centers. Um, JLab has um, some, some resources. Uh, you can look at cloud resources. Um, there's also all the DOE. So Department of Energy uh, has, has invested a lot, a lot of money into what are called um, uh, leadership class facilities, these large scale computing platforms. So what you see at the bottom right here is an illustration of Summit, which is which was until very recently the most powerful computer on the planet. What, what they're effectively do is they make those available to researchers like ourselves um, as long as you submit an application form. So you have to do what's called an insight proposal. You submit it like a normal proposal, su suggesting why you need the additional resources and how you would go forward with it. Uh, it gets reviewed by somebody like myself or somebody else from Oak Ridge, of course, or other facilities. And then they say, okay, we'll move forward. Uh, there's also other ways to get access to these machines. So there's the leadership computing challenges. And also um, the directors of these facilities, they have discretionary funds where they, they can say, you've missed a deadline for the proposal, but what you're proposing is so interesting that we'll let you go through and there's this discretion for when people miss that. I mean, I've actually been lucky enough to be a benefactor of, of one of those discretionary proposals where I, I didn't actually, uh, I, I missed a deadline and, and they were like, no problem. So again, those are resources and those are the kind of the software stacks that you could at least start your data science journey with, okay? So now I'm gonna um, kind of work through, uh, as I did with the, the grid, talk, I, I kind of typically like to go through kind of a case scenario to give you kind of a feeling for how this might play out in terms of a real world application. Um, so this, this is, you know, what does a data science pipeline kind of look like to some extent? Uh, and you have to ask, ask obvious questions or at least they seem obvious when you read them, but it's, you know, a lot of people overlook these. So what question are you trying to answer with the data? And again, that sounds really obvious, but it's it's not always that apparent uh, to either the data scientist hearing it from the domain expert, and vice versa. So there's there's sometimes uh, quite a bit of a, a gap in 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 what you can actually do with a certain amount of data, given the question you're trying to answer. So so making sure you've converged on that and understanding that uh, to its truest form is really really important. Um, the other thing is, you know, do we actually have the right data to answer that question. And again, that sounds obvious, but it, I, I've seen this time and time again where th the answer was no. Uh, I'll give you a very clear example. A lot of times there's people that have sensors on the field and they take trace data. So time series data, they, they're monitoring maybe temperature and they're maybe monitoring voltage or so. Um, 
And so you could argue that, oh, I can make a predictive tool that says I could predict the, the voltage for the next 20 minutes. And if I see something that's outside my predictions, I could say that's a problem, that's an anomaly, right? Well, the problem with that is there's some components that are missing from that data. Most in, first and foremost, what were the set points of the instrument and were they changed? So having, and, and a lot of times they'll give you the traces of the measurement, but not the set points of the instrument. And without that, you cannot really infer what the causal relationship was. So was the change in temperature due to a change in a set point or was it actually due because there's an actual emerging problem, you know, as an example. So again, you have to ask the right question, but then you also have to make sure that the data that you have is, is adequate to solve that problem, that question you're looking for, okay? And the other thing is, what do we know about the data? Is the data, do we already know some, um, some, you know, if you have multiple source, do we already know that one is causal to the other? So does one impact the other so, so that you could already uh, include that into your models when you're doing some predictive model analysis? Um, so those are things that you have to think about. Uh, is there, for example, do you have a clear uh, physical equation that you can leverage uh, given the data? So if you know that this has an exponential property, um, that is something you could put into the model that it should at least know that that's part of the problem, that, that should be part of the model. So those are, those are the kind of things I mean here by what should you know about the data. Uh, and the other thing to keep in mind in, in data science is not machine learning. And so a lot of things we do is actually pre-machine learning. So we're doing a lot of work on the data sources, the data preparation. And a lot of times you can solve the problem before you ever get to the machine learning application. As much as you know, we, we think machine learning is sexy and really interesting, uh, it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily required for some of the work that you need to do. So again, making sure that you're, you're really using the tools appropriately when, when necessary. So in a typical work, uh, workflow, uh, you have the data source. You need to understand, is it real or synthetic? What is the quality of the data? What is the dimensionality? What is the format? What's the density and what's the size? Those are kind of questions and I'll go through that in the next slide to kind of explain what I mean here. Uh, once you have the data, you have to do you know, data cleaning, uh, data restructuring, uh, identify correlations, uh, identify whether the data has a, is capturing the dynamics of interest and also how do you visualize that data? And then once you've done all that work, then you can start asking yourself, do I have a problem that is more classification? Is it a regression? Am I doing clustering, feature extraction? And that, that is dictated by the type of data that you have. These, are, these fall very specifically in very specific areas. So, it's not, yeah, so that really is dictated by your data. Finally, once you have a model, you've figured out what applications are appropriate, you then go into the cross-validation application and also the hyperparameter optimization, which is called HPO. <clears throat> At the end of the day, you get some predictions, you have some confidence levels, and hopefully you could explain some of it, okay? So let's jump into the data sources right away. Um, so these are questions you should always ask yourself as you're starting your data, data science path. <clears throat> You know, is my data, is the data that I've collected uh, labeled or not? And is, a, is it real world data? And, and I have a student that literally recently told me uh, she was working a project with me uh, and she goes, oh my gosh, uh, real world data, data is messy. And, you know, you should make sure that everybody that hears any of your talks knows that ahead of time. And I can confess to that. It's, 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 it's much, much easier when you have synthetic data once you start realizing, hey, I'm gonna to have to deal with some real world data, then you have to, there's, there's a lot more work that is involved and you really have to account for that in, in your pipeline. Uh, so things are like, there'll be missing data, there'll be gaps in the traces, or there'll be some, some, some of the sensors for an image sensor might have some, some, some of the pixels will be burnt, so not working, or they'll be very bursty and noisy. So there's all these elements that really will impact how the machine learning um, results will, will, will present themselves. So you have to keep that in mind. Then you have to ask yourself, how was the data actually created? And when I say that, it's, is it organization and how is it integration, integrated with the collection of the other various sources of data? So for an example, if I have a lot of different sources that are collecting over time, 
do they need to be temporally aligned? So do I have to time align them and do I have to resample them if that's the case? So that's really, really important uh, to understand the data, how it's been curated and whether that's gonna become your responsibility or is that something they've already done? And if you, how well do you understand their process if they've done it for you? There's of course a data format that's really important. You know, the, the images, which like cat, dogs, trees, whatever. Uh, temporal, which is like time series, I'm measuring some weather patterns or I'm measuring a voltage or, or whatever. Uh, you have categorical data sets where there are labelings, A, B, C, up to Z. And then there's ordinal data sets that are rankings. Uh, so you can say, give me a value between one and five and, th and they are related to each other, right? So these are now ordinal, they're, they're, there's a relationship. So kind of like an extension of the uh, categorical, if you will. The other thing, thing that you want, need to consider is what is the dimensionality of the problem? Is it a high dimensional problem? Uh, so an image is a good example of a high dimensional problem, or you might have like a large amount of traces that you're addressing, uh, or is it low dimensional, like a single variable sensor? Um, so that really dictates um, what you can do in terms of algorithms uh, and also you know, how, how well you, you perform it. So, so all these questions are kind of leading you towards the right algorithm to some extent. Another question that you should ask yourself is, how many samples do I have? So you might have a very high dimensional dense data set, but you might not have a lot of data or you might have a lot of data. So for example, images, you'll have tens of thousands of these. And so this is very good. And you're, you know, you could use deep learning if you wanted to. Uh, and you could have these large time series data sets. And again, perfect for, for deep something. But in the event that you have very few data sets, that really limits your ability of what techniques you can do. And it goes both ways. Some techniques that are good for limited data sets are not so good for large data sets, okay? And so when we talk about limited data set, we're talking about you know one or a few experimental measurements or, or simulations that are really expensive. So here I'm probably thinking, okay, I'm probably going to do something like a Bayesian optimization technique or Bayesian, you know, Gaussian regressor. And then maybe if I'm doing optimization, then it's Bayesian optimization with some, some acquisition function that makes sense. But in this context, again, that's because it's limited data and also the dimensionality is small. Um, so there's, there's all these trade-offs when you think about your algorithms and how you should approach the problem. Um, uh, one of the key questions is if it is the data um, capturing the dynamics of a physical process of interest. And so th that could be simply if, if it's a oscillatory problem, pro if there's a oscillation in your data set and you're not capturing, you're, you're taking too little data to capture that, that oscillation, obviously it's not appropriate, but, but also keeping in mind that this data has to actually capture the dynamics of your physics. Other times you have data sets that are completely distinct samples. Like an image is a great example. You have 10 images, they don't rely on each other. There's nothing there. There's just, they're distinct. So there's kind of that difference in, are you capturing dynamics, modeling dynamics, or are you modeling just classification or things like that? Uh, at the end of the day, what you really need to do is understand the inputs and the outputs of features for, of, of, of interest for analysis. So like, what are the critical inputs that I need and what are the critical outputs that I need? Okay, so I'm gonna kind of go through a couple examples just to illustrate some caveats with real data. They're very quick and obvious, but I just wanna illustrate the question. Here is an example of a bunch of traces. You have the amplitude on the left axis, uh, on your Y axis, the time on your X axis, and you have this waveform, and you have this one weird waveform that I think everybody could see that is green, that is different than the other ones. Interestingly enough, this was classified by the curator as being exactly all the same. <clears throat> you could clearly see they're not the same. And though that becomes the data science responsibility in terms of dealing with data, you have to actually look at the data, ensure that this is truly what they're saying is consistent. Because if you had fed this particular waveform into your training cycle, it would have had negative consequences. Another example is doing statistical analysis where you're looking at microscopic statistics uh, to kind of identify some, some blatant problems with the data set. So again, uh, in the right left figure, I have an amplitude with, uh, as a function of time. Uh, so it's a, another waveform. And then I could convert that into you know, what is commonly known as a, 
a box plot where you're considering the mean, the quantiles, 25, 75 quantiles, and then you're looking for the outliers. And you can see that the first, um, the first collection of this data set is perfectly consistent with each other. And then you have these three outliers that are kind of odd. What turns out to be is that the, 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 the first outlier, which is on number two, and the next one num on, on label D on the count uh, pulse count, those turned out to be explicitly the same. And what we found out was by doing this analysis, which again, is not a very complicated analysis, but it identified that on the data acquisition, they had a ring buffer that accidentally would overwrite sometimes in this section two, which made it problematic because, but now we know the problem is there. So these are just examples of where you may find problems in the data, although, you know, where the, where as a data scientist, it's your responsibility to kind of do those checks and balances before you really go into any kind of modeling of the data system. You need to make sure the data is okay. And so again, simple examples just to illustrate the point. The other thing that you have to do is be somewhat creative in thinking about the problem in different contexts. Uh, in, in this context, again, we have a waveform of function of time and we can now start looking at causal relationship between sample to sample adjacent samples. So what you're seeing in the 2D illness illustration is essentially for every single sample, I'm looking at how it relates to the adjacent sample in time. And what you'll see is, although you don't see these patterns being very clearly visible in the, in, in the time domain, when you look at it, this in what I would call like a quasi-causal domain, you're seeing clear lobe patterns that are actually something that one could easily identify with a convolutional network or some kind of uh, unit, right? So this gives me a better sense uh, or a different representation of this particular data that might be easier for certain techniques to work. So again, this is a bit of being creative, thinking about the problem, um, one could obviously also change this into a time and frequency domain and have a size again. So you could have different ways of representing this. And each one of those techniques uh, can in fact enhance the model that you're trying to build. Again, trying to think about the data in, in some kind of uh, in, 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 in unique ways that would enhance its, rep its, its representation for the machine learning model is going to help the model typically, okay? So I just, again, as a point of reference, I'm trying to make sure that uh, as I speak to this, I'm gonna give you some references of techniques or packages that are available uh, for you to consume and use right out of the box so you don't have to start all from scratch. NumPy is probably the de facto, uh, one of the de facto tabular uh, packages. Uh, it deals with multiple uh, multi-dimensional arrays and matrices. Uh, it's extremely powerful in terms of doing various types of computations related to those types of data, uh, those data types. The thing to make sure that you know, and I think if anybody's a Python programmer, they, they probably have experienced this and, and know, but I just want to reiterate, uh, for loops are horrible in, in Python at any point in time. And this is, exp this is amplified when you're trying to do for loops in matrices or so forth. Uh, these put, these programs were developed explicitly for you to be able to do matrix manipulation. So if I have a vector times a matrix, there's no need for a for loop, just use it as a matrix. You will, the computational time is extremely different between the two and you'll be you know, sitting around for any for loops. So, so please, please, please avoid your for loops. Make sure that you think in linear algebra terms almost all the time. It will save you so much computational uh, headaches. Um, so that's my little uh, rant for, for or, or cautionary tale there. Uh, pandas. Pandas is another interesting package that kind of builds off uh, NumPy, but also has is has a more of a database feel if you're a database programmer. And so this allows you to, to change the view of the data and, and kind of group things by certain types. So there's a lot of nice grouping functions. And so it's it's to some extent an augmentation to the NumPy techniques. Uh, the next one is Dask. Um, this is uh, an extremely powerful uh, enhancement, if you will, of NumPy and, and Pandas. Um, you know, as an easy example, a lot of times if you have a rather large data file, if it's too big for memory and you try to run NumPy by just reading the file in, two things are going to happen. If it's not too big for memory, it will just take forever to, to load and you're going to wait for nothing. 
uh, or it's just not going to work. With Dask, what you do is you're essentially doing what's called lazy loading, and it will pretty well stage things for you and allow you to run this uh, when only when you tell it to do uh, a compile does it actually execute the calculations that you care about. So again, this is extremely powerful in terms of just uh, do parallelizations uh, and also doing lazy loading and other kind of data techniques that are uh, good for big data and for clusters. So that one's definitely one that if you're getting to the point where you have a lot of data and you have a big system, uh, you should probably invest some time on Dask. Uh, another one is just because a lot of people are doing image analysis, uh, Psychic Image is another package that is extremely useful for analyzing images. It kind of allows you to kind of uh, uh, do some, you know, pre-scaling of your data, some, some corrections. It does some segmentation. It does a lot of interesting tools. So it's a great, um, another great package to use when you're dealing with images. So I'll just give you some references in terms of visualization. Matplotlib is somewhat of the de facto uh, technique that people are using in Python. It allows you to do you know, histograms, scatter plots, all these correlation plots, they're, they're phenomenal. Uh, Seaborn is to some extent almost like um, Matplotlib on, on, on steroids. It's, uh, it's really very, it, it, it's really attractive. It's really, um, it's, just a, a, it's just an enhancement of the capabilities of Matplotlib. Uh, but most of the time I actually end up using Matplotlib because I don't, I don't have a need for some of the features that Seaborn does. Uh, finally, another package that might be useful for some people is, is uh, Boken. Uh, here, this allows you to have uh, interactive visualization where you know you could plot something and you could zoom in, zoom out. You could do all this thing in your notebooks. So it's really powerful to allow you to kind of on the fly do manipulations of three dimensional objects and so forth. So that one's a really nice package to use depending on the your your needs. So that kind of captures um, some of the visualizations, some of the actual base packages that you would want to use as a data scientist. Now let's go into, you know, how do we prepare for the data for, for the machine learning uh, itself? So one of the things that you probably heard about a lot and is critical uh, when doing any kind of modeling of, of your data sets is normalization. What I mean by that is essentially, you, you need to normalize your data in order to provide the data this common scale. And so when you're thinking about if I have multiple input values, uh, I need to actually have this one common scale that allows me to now have it so that once I do a minimization, that this one variable doesn't completely dominate from the other variables, that it's actually roughly on the same scaling, okay? And so that's a really important aspect of, of how you do your optimization in, in your machine learning models. The other thing that you're gonna have to do a lot of times is doing data reformatting. Um, so that's changing the structure of your data into different types of data representations based on the architecture that you're going to use. So becoming a bit of a NumPy a reformatter a guru is, is something that's invaluable. Uh, so an example that I put here is time series. You might have a full trace, but when you're actually pushing this into a recurrent neural network, you're going to have to restructure it so that you could have what is called a look back, which is how many how many how many samples are you going to use in your input as your as your x, and how many samples are you going to use in your forward look forward, which is your y, and so you have to kind of restructure that. So being comfortable and being able to reformat your data all the time is a critical component of being able to kind of push it to different architectures. Um, that, that also kind of lends itself to this multimodal models, um, or I could sometimes call it a hybrid model, where you might have multiple di different types of data formats uh, coming in. So video, uh, some sense trace traces, maybe some images. Uh, uh, you might have a lot of different things coming in. Uh, and then what you can do is effectively, you'll, you'll need to kind of reformat your data such that the sampling and the time alignment is Correct, and then after that, you can push it into one common model that actually addresses each mode differently, but as an aggregate is able to uh, um, solve that one prediction. And so there you also have to make sure that you've normalized your data on all the different modes. And then when you do a combined loss function, you're accounting for the different contributions correctly. So those are kind of like um, things that you have to think about once you're getting, pre you're preparing, once the data has been cleaned and all that, you want to start thinking about how do I actually prepare for machine learning itself. 
And so this leads us into the question of building a machine learning model. Um, so a lot of times, so here, you know, what do we actually want from our models? You know, this is effectively a transformation that goes from the input space to the output space. So, so as illustrated in the figure, you have some vector v uh, x going into some some unknown black box, if you will, some nature, and it has to give you some y. Uh, and then you can see here we kind of bypass nature, and we've got some machine learning algorithm here. In this context, it is going to be an MLP. Uh, some of the features that you want to have is definitely is it generalizable. Uh, and what I mean by that is if I apply, if I train the model on a certain data set and then I run it on a different data set that is orthogonal, will I get the similar predictions and the similar performance? So that's a critical component. And that's actually part of the cross-validation technique that I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, but I think to keep in mind is that there's other elements that go even deeper than that when you think about generalizability. Uh, the question is, does the model capture the fundamental transformation that I care about? And I think the easiest way to think about this is if I take this model here and I take X to Y, um, that can be just uh, you know, some black box model. But if this becomes something that's more physically meaningful, for example, F equals MA, so the force uh, and mass acceleration, like if, if I actually have now captured the essence of physical uh, fundamental transformations, that is much more fundamental and much more generalizable than a model that simply goes from A to uh, X to Y, okay? So as you're thinking about, as you go through your path of developing models, uh, a lot of times you'll start with just the, the brute force approach, but then you should step back and say, is there a way for me to kind of restructure things so that I'm trying to get to create a model that captures the really, the, the essence of what's happening, okay? And then there's the question about explainable. Can I explain what I've actually done? And so there's been a lot of research here and I just decided to put a, an illustration here of, of you know, an image classification problem where they have these heat maps to try to explain where within the image are, is a neural network or the machine learning algorithm focusing on to be in order to actually tell you what it is. And so you can say that it, it's always focusing on the face, that is really the central, the feature that seems to matter the most for these particular images. So that is a form of explainability. You're trying to have a better sense of what is a model telling me? Why is it telling me that? And so there's been, there's a lot of, that's a research field on its own to try to understand that. There's also the element of stability and guarantees. And so of course, if the model is not stable, then it's hard to give anybody a guarantee. Um, and what do I mean by that? Um, when you actually analyze the model itself, you, you might have millions of weights. And, and there's been a lot of research about trying to understand whether you're in a, in a, in a regime where you're in a non-convex -con uh, area. So if you look at this uh, figure, you have figure A, you have this very jaggy, sharp, uh, a lot of local minimas and very, very easy to find yourself not finding the optimal solution. And moreover, if you're not in the optimal solution, it's quite possible that then you might find yourself, if, if any of the conditions change a little bit, you're finding yourself predicting something wildly different than what you would have done otherwise. Whereas you look at figure B, this is a nice uh, a smooth convex solution. And so the, the obvious the hypothesis here is if you could, you could modify your architectures in order to reflect a much smoother convex surface in the, in, in, in rel uh, relevant to the loss function, uh, then you're more likely to have a nice stable solution, which now allows you to think about guarantees. Okay, so there's all these questions that you should be asking yourself when you're building this particular model. You know, is it generalizable? Can I explain it? And is it stable? And can I provide some guarantees with it? And so now the next slide is kind of like the all right, well, I, I, I wanna build a model. I know I'm already at this stage where I'm building a model, but what model should I have? There's like a gazillion of them. And so I'm not gonna go through the gazillion of them, but what I will do is kind of give you some guidance in terms of where you're gonna find yourself depending on the data set you have. Again, this goes all the way back to, you know, I have some data, it has all these, it has all these behaviors and, and properties. And what does that mean when I'm thinking about data science? <clears throat> so, 
at the heart of it, you have machine learning. And I'm not going to talk about reinforcement learning today. That will be uh, left for tomorrow. Uh, but I will we'll quickly talk about uh, the other two. So supervised versus unsupervised. So when you're given data, typically you've been given data that either has some kind of label, which is like, this is a truth. This is what my Y should look like. Or you might have a data set that says, I just have data and show me a pattern. And so when I have labeled data, that falls into the category of supervised learning. When I don't have any um, labels or so I have just a collection of data that is falls under the category of unsupervised learning. And so what you can do really depends on where you fall into this. So if you have a discrete Y, you fall into the region of classification. So you're saying, does this, is this A, B, or C, or one, two, you know, whatever classification you want, but it's discrete. And so you could say that this is, is, is it this, is there a fault or is this a bird or is this a whatever? That's a perfect example of classification. Uh, in science community, we'll do things like, is it the Higgs or is it background, right? Signal versus background classification. Uh, when you're talking about continuous predictions, um, you're talking about regression techniques. So can I predict the weather? So weather forecasting. Uh, for our case, when it comes to accelerated complex, can I predict the, the behavior of the system for the next you know, five minutes? And from there, can I infer if there's going to be a problem? So we're using regressions to actually forecast the future in order to determine what to do next. So it's kind of a, a step towards, it, it actually falls a little bit as a precursor to reinforcement learning. So this is something that you think about when, when you're trying to go do forward predictions. Uh, in the flip side with unsupervised learning, similar, you have, uh, you have, um, you have this discrete where you're saying, I want, I have this data, please cluster it in X amount of clusters. So you have a discrete output where you have N number of clusters. Uh, and there you can, in, and so that, that is where these techniques fall very nicely to, to find are there clusters or patterns. And then you could actually evaluate how many clusters should I have given this data set? You know, how many things are very distinct? Uh, the other flip side is if you have something continuous where you're asking, I want to go from, you know, maybe 20,000 variables down to only maybe two or three, you know, variables that are really capturing the, the essence of that data set. Uh, this is data reduction or feature extraction. You're really trying to understand where you're going with your data. Okay, so, so those are kind of that the very broad brush. These are kind of the, the different approaches to solving problems. And that's why you're, you're, you'll hear supervised learning versus un, unsupervised learning all the time. And now I, hopefully this gives you a better idea of how everything falls into place and how you could go. Now, of course, within these techniques, the type of data makes a big difference, like a regression technique. Uh, if I have a very small data sample or have low dimensionality, I may go with a Gaussian process approach. Whereas if I have a lot of big data and um, large dimensionality, uh, Gaussian processes will definitely not work. And I will want to use something like maybe a, re a recurrent neural network, uh, such as an LSTM or a GRU. So, so really it depends about the, the, the data density and so forth. So, but at least the first step of distinguishing what where you fall into the spectrum in machine learning applications is fairly well defined. And so with these, uh, with these applications, there are a lot of packages out there. Uh, and so I wanna kind of highlight three that I feel are, are very powerful and very useful. Uh, SKLearn is, is probably the most generic of the, of the three. This really uh, has uh, just an amazing amount of different techniques uh, from, from normalization techniques to clustering, uh, unsupervised, supervised. It really has it all. It's, it's a really nice package. Uh, and then you have Keras and TensorFlow, which has become very popular. Uh, this was built from Google. It's open source also. Um, in fact, I actually tend to gravitate towards this package. Um, I really like how, how you could build build things pretty quickly uh, and, and, and uh, it's very nice. Uh, PyTorch is another one that, you know, again, this is like Mac versus, you know, Microsoft or something, you know, they're, they, they each have their strengths and weaknesses. They, they're, they're very good platforms. Uh, I have a lot of colleagues that use PyTorch. I have a lot of colleagues that use TensorFlow. 
uh, less so in sklearn, but we, we all seem to use sklearn for some of the fundamental components of the data science workflow. But typically when we're doing these uh, model developments uh, specifically, uh, then we're focusing on either PyTorch or, or Keras TensorFlow. Um, so again, uh, just to give you some, some, some things to look at when you're, you know, you're going through the, 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 the zoo of algorithms, um, there's, there's some supervised algorithm like Gaussian processes, uh, support vector machine, neural networks, which is I think what most people think machine learning is now, but it isn't. And then you have random forests. Uh, in contrast, you have unsupervised, you have k-mean clusters, which is the one that I was talking about just for clustering. Uh, there's other techniques there, but I mean, that's largely what a lot of people are using for, for, for fairly fast analysis. Uh, it does suffer from um, data. And so there's modifications to that one to allow you to address uh, as you're increasing more and more data sets, uh, larger and larger data sets. Uh, principal component analysis is another one that does data reduction. Uh, keep in mind that one's a linear technique. And then there's autoencoders that um, are, are, are great for nonlinear problems uh, for data reduction and also for anomaly detection. So, so once you have a model, so I'm not gonna go through how the loss function and how you minimize and so forth, but I'm just wanna, again, this is a high overview, but once you have this uh, model that you've defined, you need to train it. And there are some certain rules or, or or conventionalities within the field about how you go about training. And so I wanna just speak to the, um, the cross-validation approach. Um, so here, um, once you have your data set, you know, the easiest way to, to kind of do a unbiased analysis is to pick about 80% of your data uh, for training, okay? and then 20% for the, the testing. And, and these are completely orthogonal data sets. And so from the 80% that you're using for training, uh, you're gonna pick another 20% or so for what's called validation, okay? Validation is used while you're training to evaluate the performance of your model and whether you're overfitting or other, or other concerns you may have. So this is, allows you to have a orthogonal data set to evaluate the performance of the model as it is training. The test data is actually post-mortem. After you finish training your model, you use a test data set in order to understand how well the, the model has generalized and how well it performs on a data set it's never seen before, okay? So it's really an integral component of your machine learning and your data science workflow to always do these orthogonal data sets. And this applies to beyond just this machine learning workflow, but it, 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 is, it is definitely critical. Uh, a more advanced technique um, to kind of use all the data, because you're losing quite a bit of data potentially uh, when you do this simpler splitting, is what's called k-fold cross-validation. Here you're randomly creating k groups of your data set. So you're creating k subgroups. And then you're kind of swapping the, the, the K groups between training and testing, always being orthogonal. And so now you're able to actually leverage the full data set as you're always comparing the performance orthogonally to, to, the, to, the, uh, to each other. Uh, one thing that I'll just bring up um, when it comes to, to, to training any type of model is to understand whether you're in the interpolation or extrapolation regime uh, models are very good at interpolating. Uh, and unless there's some physics knowledge that you, you, you know and can incorporate, extrapolation is, is going to fail miserably, uh, typically. Um, this is a good example is when you have a non-stationary problem, which means the problem is evolving over time. And so if, if you don't know how the evolution is working, it will only know what it knows with the historical data it's seen. It will not understand uh, how the evolution should behave over time. And so again, that, that's a very important thing to keep in mind when you're starting to look towards doing these kind of predictive analyses where you're trying to forecast anything is if it's non-stationary and you don't understand that behavior, uh, you will not be able to model it correctly. Um, so a lot of times what people will do, uh, will, they'll, they'll try to find a way to incorporate some of the physics knowledge that they have uh, in order to have that prediction, at least satisfy the physics that you would expect to be there and then model the additional terms that we don't quite know as well. 
so that's um, that's again another cautionary tale um, that I wanted to share with everybody and make sure that they understand the uh, implications of if 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 you're trying to do uh, predictive analysis. There's also a whole field of how you actually, once you have a model, you've gone through the data cleaning, everything's done, you've got a model, and you now want to optimize that model. Uh, and, and various tweaks can make a substantial difference in the performance. As you saw from the loss curve, uh, uh, loss landscape plot that I talked about earlier on, uh, the difference between putting a skip connection and not having a skip connection was a difference between having a very uh, non-convex solution versus a very nice convex solution. So those are things that are, 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 are monitored at that level. But on top of that, one can, can ask the question, should I change my learning rate? Should I change the number of layers? Should I change my dropout rates? Is the kernel the right kernel? Uh, I don't have the optimizer, but maybe I should have changed my optimizer. Uh, maybe I should have changed my loss function. So there's all these things that could be possibly improve or uh, change the performance of your model. And so those packages are dedicated just to analyze those particular, uh, those kind of features. And so two of them that I just wanted to bring up was MLflow, which is this um, essentially an ML package that allows you to kind of mo monitor the, the life cycle of, uh, of your ML workflow, but also allows you to also scan and optimize on the, uh, high uh, the hyperparameter optimization component. Another one, if you're using TensorFlow, is that there is an intrinsic package that is part of it that lets you uh, optimize on the hyperparameters by just making some subtle modifications to your TensorFlow model. So very non-intrusive, pretty easy to implement once you understand the basics of, 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 of uh, Keras models. So those are kind of two packages that I would you know, suggest once you get to the stage where you're trying to optimize and squeeze out the most out of your models. So with that, I'm gonna call it done. Um, just a reminder that there's, uh, I, I, I've been told I have two more sessions to give uh, and, and I, will mo I will focus on, you know, forecasting. I'll just give you uh, an example, a code-based example. I will talk about few-shot learning, which is a technique um, that, that addresses using some of these machine learning neural networks, but when you have very few data sets. Uh, and then hybrid model, how do you compose multiple models together to, to kind of extract out that information? Uh, and what, what, should, what should you consider? Um, the focal point um, for tomorrow though, will, will be predominantly on reinforcement learning since I haven't not touched it at all. And I, I thought it'd be a fun exercise just to have everybody kind of uh, play around a little bit with the concept of agents and environments and you know, how do you optimize? How do you make things reactive? Yeah, how do you do that whole workflow? So that's gonna be probably the heart of tomorrow. I'll spend most of my time there and, and hopefully we'll get to some of these other topics, but I really, uh, I think everybody, uh, I'm suspecting people will have fun just doing a bit of reinforcement learning. And so as a, as a shameless plug, I will also say that uh, uh, we do have a data science position at JLab. If you know anybody that is looking and is, uh, very excited and eager and very proficient in machine learning and data science. Feel free to uh, forward this information to them. And with that, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. It was a really interesting uh, lecture. I was actually, while you were talking, I was actually using some of the program that you were citing. So <laughs> and, uh, if anyone has questions, uh, I see Trevor, please go ahead. Hi, yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Um, really interesting talk. Um, my question was, was about the um, part we were talking about using data for training your system. And you, you talked about using 80% of your available data to actually train and then 20% for testing it. Um, it does it typically matter um, how you use the data, meaning like, would you use 80% of it that are all sequential or you, you're randomly choosing that 80%? Right, so that really depends on the data type that you have. If it's something like a, a distinct data, data, like in images, then it doesn't really matter. But if like, as you mentioned, if it's sequential, if it, like it, it's a trace, then it does matter. Uh, so if you just simply uh, just take the first half, like the first 80 of the trace and then predict on the last, 20, there might be very different dynamics in that 
of the 80 and the 20. So then you're not really necessarily capturing what you need to capture to make the model really truly robust and predictive. Uh, typically when you have uh, something like a time series analysis, you will want to kind of slice it around so that you're doing uh, sequentially predictions, but you're able to, to capture more of the trace so that you're in different regions of the dynamic system. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Next, uh, I think we have a question from uh, Daniel and Damiak. Yes, thank you. Um, so it seems like from these examples that you've given for machine learning algorithms, it's useful when we want to be able to make predictions, but we don't have a good model for how something works. But in physics theory, we try to build our models up from first principles. So is there a way that machine learning can help us do that? Or are these just completely orthogonal approaches to making predictions? So I think, I think there is, so I don't think they're completely orthogonal. I think largely there's a lot of orthogonalities for sure. Um, you could A, incorporate the physics within the model. So whatever you already know, you could incorporate it into there. Uh, and so that makes your, your, uh, your model for machine learning more, more accurate and more predictive. But there's some other interesting studies that are ongoing where you're looking at changing the, uh, the, the representation. So let's imagine I go from a, the X, uh, a coordinate system like uh, a uh, Cartesian coordinate system, but I know the physics of relevance maybe is in uh, spherical coordinates. So what you want to do is, is actually be able to maybe do that transformation, identify what is the transformation to go into coordinate system of interest. So identify the right bases that actually has the generalized physics that you care about. You see what I'm saying? Mm. So, so, a pendulum is a good example, right? You could try to do this with X, Y, Z, and it's a bloody mess to work through. But it's pretty trivial if you just have your spherical coordinate, your, your cylindrical or spherical, depending on how many dimensions. So, so that's a good example of if I had done the coordinate transformation, the equations become quite easy and elegant. And so that's kind of what I'm, um, so I think there's some, a lot of potential there in terms of trying to understand how do we get to the right representation to identify an elegant solution. So I think there's a lot there, but I think it's an open field. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Yep. I can send you some papers on this. Uh, sure. Really insightful, thank you. Sure, and uh, if you want to send anything, uh, we have uh, also a lot of uh, Slack, Slack channel and one is uh, exactly for this, uh, for this uh, series of lectures. So if you want to interact uh, with any students there or send any references, uh, Slack is a, probably a good uh, medium, let's say. <laughs> and uh, another thing, I don't see any other question actually. Not on the chat, not on the Slack channel. So, oh, Alberto, actually. Uh -oh. Actually, I, I have, since nobody else wants, I can do this uh, without abusing of my prerogative. <laughs> uh, there, 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 um, um, actually, I have two, but I will stop after the first one to give space to others. On page 10, uh, you had a one-dimensional problem, and you repackaged it in a two-dimensional problem. <sighs> what exactly uh, have you done there? there? In this case, I, I, I simply look at the causal relationships from one sample to the next uh, for every sample. And so the reality is this matrix is actually duplicated at the, at the, uh, at the diagonal, right? So it's essentially looking at how, how, if I take sample zero, how does it relate to all the other samples that I have? So in amplitude, sorry. So if I take amplitude of sample zero, now look at amplitude in sample 10, take the difference. That's all I'm doing. Something pretty simple, but it illustrates if you put on a log scale, a very strong correlation between these samples that would have been, would have been completely lost when you look at this visually using a trace. So for me, optically, I've now identified some very clear patterns. And the reason why I care about this uh, in this particular analysis is you know, I was showing you how you could just, you could look at the heat maps to identify where within the pattern 
we are saying this is a dog, like this is a terrier, or this is this is a cat, and it, it identifies where in that in that image it's finding that property. So here I'm using this visual representation because when I use a convolutional neural network, I'm now able to say not only is there an anomaly or a difference between image A and B in this context, but now I could tell you where it is. And then I could tell the domain experts, look here, there's something interesting here. And they could tell, and then we could have a dialogue about what is that a instrumentation problem or is that something else? So it gives us a little bit more handles about what we could do, hopefully. Okay, thank you. Okay, and uh, actually before you were, uh, before you intervened, I actually had another question, which is uh, when we were talking about the data sources, uh, what is the main difference when analyzing, for example, experimental data and the lattice data with um, this kind of uh, data pipeline or? Right, so, so in the context of the data between real, real and and theoretical or synthetic, uh, uh, there's typically always going to be some conversion from, from one to another, if, if you're comparing the two, right? Uh, but in this context, I was really referring to the fact that you know, when you do synthetic data, uh, they're idealized. There's very rarely do you, you know, by default, you don't introduce spiky or noise. You might do that systematically as you evolve. But when you're given real data, there's, there's literally things that are just missing. And so when you invert the problem to understand, so this is an inverse problem, when you try to inverse the problem, there's th some of that mapping needs to be better understood. Mm, okay. Okay, I see. And uh, what looks like, yeah, sorry, I'm just checking if there are other questions, but there are not. So I guess this concludes the- uh, no, 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 oh. no. My second no. There's one more, Alberto. <laughs> He's taking his <laughs> second question now. <laughs> yeah. You're right, you're right. <laughs> uh, so you are talking about cost validation on page 18. Uh, in what sense did you call two data sets orthogonal? In the sense that they are literally uh, not, there's no sample that is in one data set that is part of the other data set. So they're truly orthogonal in the fact that there's no overlapping data points. No yeah. Okay, 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 thank you. Okay, this uh, I think concludes the lecture of today and uh, also the series of lecture for today, but uh, we still have uh, the recap, the um, presentation from uh, John Wei. So in uh, half an hour, we can, uh, see everyone on uh, blue jeans not on zoom this time be careful and uh, so see you soon and i have a couple more announcements just, just to reinforce your learning uh, the, there is a deadline for abstract submissions today for your presentations and we do expect all of you to do that so please 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 do that it's a big big occasion for all of us and um what, what was the other one there is tomorrow at 4.30 p.m. also Blue Jeans, a, an interesting workshop on how to write resumes and a, a job application for industry. And it was interesting that Malachi showed you the link of a real life uh, job application, uh, jo 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 job ad. And yep. uh, so have a look at that as well, I would say. And but anyway, there will be a, a workshop on how to do this kind of job applications, for example. And um, in preparation for your mock job interview, that if you want to do that, you can send a mock job application and then get interviewed. And the deadline for that is June 11. And finally, again, on Saturday, we have, have the first hall tours. We will be touring Hall A and Hall B remotely it should be fun and interesting. And the guides will try to be as interactive as possible and not quite like being there, but we'll do our best. Alberto, here is Astrid. There is one more announcement, I think, um, for tomorrow morning, actually. Uh, we have the event with Lisa Serslaw mm -hmm. about 
uh, fostering, what, what's the name again? Fostering a positive workplace. Positive workplace environment, exactly. So uh, that's at 8.30, if I'm not mistaken. Can someone maybe check in parallel? In any case, it's 8.45. Also, 8.45, thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, it's also on blue jeans. So these are events that are uh, outside of the scope of lectures that are streamed to the the world, you know. So they're more private hugs events. That's why they're on blue jeans. So tomorrow at eight forty five ET would be that event. But 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 the, the, the first one is part of the school is absolutely not. Uh, uh, both that we mentioned are, are it's mandatory. Yeah, yeah. Optional. They are part of the school. So please please come. Okay. And after that, we have uh, the photo shoot or the photo screenshots. <laughs> Better. So, yeah. And thank you very much to Malakai for this uh, really interesting uh, lesson. And uh, thank you to all of you for uh, attending uh, the third day of uh, AGS uh, Summer School. Thank you very much. See you soon. <laughs>